Chapter One of Eddie of Jackson's Gang. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. Chapter One On the Go. April howled through the trees that stretched dripping fingers above a hut in a section of the city boasting no larger habitation. The laws of the nondescripts who drifted in and out of the sheds there were much like those of the foreign legion. No one questioned a newcomer or an old inhabitant as to his past, present, or future. They came and went with no more interest in one another than a toothless sailor has in styles of toothbrushes. No one in this squatter village had lived there long enough to remember when George's Rousseau and the little boy Eddie had first moved into their hut. George's, however, for some strange reason, knew the comings and goings of all the others. He made it his business to know these things, and while he talked to no one, not even seeming to take his eyes off the ground as he came and went, still he missed nothing. Had the others been interested enough in him, they would have noticed a strange, hunted look in those shifty eyes. Today, as the wind howled and cold blades of rain knifed across the roof, George's Rousseau was pacing back and forth in the single room, muttering something to himself. In one corner on the floor, covered with a bundle of old clothing, lay a boy asleep. For the moment he knew nothing of the elemental storm outside, or of the more violent strife raging in the mind of the man, with whom he lived a life without affection, but also without active abuse. But soon the crashing of the thunder awakened Eddie, and he lay there listening to its roll. Then a steel-blue flash of lightning illuminated the hut, and in its glare he saw George's standing in the middle of the room. You awake? Yes, the thunder scared me out of my sleep. You don't know much about the city, do you? How could I? I never go any place except with you. I am thinking of taking you some place. That's fine, George's. When will we go? I think now. Now? In this awful storm? This late at night? Yes. Get up. I can't stand this any longer. I take you to a good place. You should be in a good place. I should have put you in a good place long ago. God will punish George's bad some day. Why did I? Eddie got up from his hard bed at once. He'd always thus obeyed George's ever since he first met him. George's, as we have said, had never really been unkind to Eddie. There just had never been any friendly relations between them. The man had gone about his own life and work, whatever it was, and Eddie had gone from place to place with him, much as a dog goes along with its master. At times they had lived in very comfortable circumstances in fine residential districts, at other times in cheap apartment houses, and more than once in just such surroundings as the present one. Put on your heavy coat. It will help to keep you dry. Eddie took the coat down from the hook and got into it. This great coat had served him well, though it had never been made for him. Georgia had given it to him one winter afternoon, when they were on the move, much as they were tonight. Often since then it had been his only bed covering. Here is a card, George has told him. Put it in your pocket and keep it dry. When you get to the place where I am taking you, give it to the sister. Looking at the card, the boy noticed that it contained just one word, Eddie. Questions arose in his mind, but he gave them no voice. He knew from past experience that, with George's, questions were useless. Before he really understood his guardian, he used to ask many things. Invariably, they went unanswered. Whatever George's wanted him to know, he told him. That was all. Now, as the lightning flashes permitted, Eddie watched George's. The silent man was gathering together the odds and ends of his possessions and packing them into an old suitcase, a receptacle which had long been associated in Eddie's mind with moving. Whenever he saw George's pick it up, he knew that the man was, for some reason he had never understood, possessed of a strange urge to get going. You ready? Yes, George's. Well, we go then. George's opened the door and stepped out into the blinding rain. Eddie followed, leaving the door of the shack dangling on its uncertain hinges. No light showed in any of the huts as they passed. Just what time it was, Eddie did not know. 
Silently the two walked along. For a while the swish and patter of the rain blotted out every other sound. Then, after about an hour's walk, they began to hear automobiles passing them now and then as nightlifers made their way home. They were now on the fringe of the city. Here and there they passed a large house where some prosperous person, shunning the city's heat and dirt, made his home. Eddie had never seen this part of town before, and the circuitous route by which they had come would make it absolutely impossible for him to retrace his steps to the shack they had long since left. After another half hour they were in front of a spreading lawn which stretched back to where a large brick house stood cold and black in the rainy night. We stop here, announced George's. You got the card? Yes, I have it in my pocket, George's. Do you want it? No, you keep it. Now you go up to that big house. Who lives there? interrupted Eddie, astonished. It is an orphan home, George's told him. Sister take good care of little boy there. You go up, ring the bell until sister let you in. If you get no answer the first time you ring, keep on ringing. They are always there. They will be in bed, of course. You will have to wait a little. Sister will take you in. Give her the card. Say nothing about George's. You never see George's again. George's go away, and no police ever find him. Eddie listened in alarm. Who was Sister? He had never met anyone of that name before, and did not know what to expect. Nor did he wish to part from George's, for while he had never actually loved the man, he had become used to him, and the association was the main part of his life. I want to stay with you, George's, he said. I don't mind that we haven't a good place to live in all the time. I want to stay with you. No, replied George's firmly. I can't stand it any longer. I should never have taken you. Go. I wait until you get up on the porch. Hurry now, or I run away and leave you here alone in the dark. For a long moment, Eddie stood there wondering what to do. Finally, he decided it would be better to follow George's command. Goodbye, George's he said, stretching out his hand to shake farewell. Goodbye, replied the man, clasping it in return. Be a good boy. Say a prayer now and then for George's. Goodbye. Eddie turned and made off toward the house. It seemed a very long time before the bell was answered, but he waited as he had been told to do. Finally lights flashed on both inside the doors and on the porch. The door opened, and for the first time in his life, Eddie came into contact with a sister. The habit seemed very strange to him, but the kindly face looking down at him told him that here was one who would be friendly to him. "'Come in, my dear child. Where did you come from at this late hour of the night?' "'A man brought me here,' said Eddie, as he entered the clean hallway, and heard the heavy door close out the sound of the rain. "'He told me to give you this card. He said I would never see him any more. I have no place to live now unless you take me.' Now, don't worry about that. We'll take good care of you. Come, you must get to bed now. Little boys like you need plenty of rest. Oh, did you have your supper? Yes. Well, then, you must go to bed. Come along. I will take you to the dormitory. Tomorrow we can talk things over. And so it was that in spite of the strangeness of the place, Eddie went off into a good, comfortable sleep to awake the following morning, and many a morning thereafter, a happy boy with other happy boys in Mount St. Joseph. End of chapter one. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter two of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter two. Mount St. Joseph. Everything was quiet at Mount St. Joseph this afternoon. It was not always so, but it happened now and then. The twenty odd little orphan boys, usually bright and talkative, walked through the various rooms and corridors as if they were in the quiet precincts of the sanctuary. A stranger might have thought their life to be very dreary and uninteresting indeed, and the discipline enforced there of the most severe type. Both of these suppositions, however, would have been far from the truth. Don't cry, my dear child. Tom will come to see you again. You know he is going to live here in the city and with devout Catholics. I'm well acquainted with the family. It was Mother Rose who thus addressed one of her charges, a yellow-headed lad of five. 
Of all the boys, Tom had been little Ben's favorite, and the good sister was trying to appease the grieving youngster. This sad and disconsolate mood came over the lads whenever one of their number left St. Joseph's, even though he was going where the future was full of promise. But what do children know about the future? To them the departure of one of their number meant the loss of a pal, meant the bursting asunder of a tie as strong to their little hearts, unaccustomed to family affection, as that which binds brothers together. Tom was gone, and little Ben was left behind, and could not reconcile himself to his loss. Eddie, you take this little lad and play with him, will you? Mother Rose finally said. Take him around to old Bessie and show him the puppies there. I'm sure he'll enjoy them now that they have their eyes open. Yes, Mother, I like little Ben. I'll be his pal if he'll let me. The loving look in Eddie's eyes was clear even to Benny's flooded orbs. Arm in arm, the two waists walked down the long corridor to the veranda from which a beautiful view met the eye. The flower gardens with their fountain, and beyond, long stretches of rolling lawn walled in at a distance by rows of elms, oaks, and willows. Directly at the front of the house, a path wound up from a busy thoroughfare, where thousands swept past daily in their automobiles. Among them were many of the proud and the mighty and the rich, hastening to and from the crowded city in their rush for wealth or pleasure or importance. Few of them ever cast a glance in the direction of Mount St. Joseph or spared a thought as to the great happiness they could have brought to the hearts of the sisters therein, and to the homeless little ones sheltered there through the kindness and self-sacrifice of these heroic nuns. "'There comes another man,' said little Ben, who under the charm of Eddie's pleasant ways was beginning to forget his loss. "'I hope he won't take you, Eddie. What would I do if you went like Tom did? If they take you, I'm going to run away from here. I just couldn't stand it. Why do people want to spoil our fun? No, little pal, he won't take me, Eddie reassured him. All I can do is sing. I'm not strong enough to do real work. Mother Rose will keep me here. She says she wants me to stay to do the singing in the chapel. While the boys were thus reasoning matters out for themselves, in typical boyish fashion, the stranger, smiling cheerfully with the evident wish of making a friendly impression, walked up to where they stood. And how are my young men today? We're all right, sir, Eddie responded. What is your name, my boy? My name is Eddie. And mine is Benny, piped up the smaller boy, and I don't like visitors. You don't like visitors? That's strange. Don't your visitors ever bring you candy and oranges? No, responded Benny in defiant tones. I don't have any visitors myself, and I don't like them to come around at all. Well, here's some nice candy for you and an orange also said the stranger soothingly. Then, so you'll not have a visitor, I'll just talk to Eddie here. How's that? Eddie doesn't like company either. Do you, Eddie? No, I don't, said Eddie. Then feeling that he must explain, he continued, You see, the reason why we don't like company here at St. Joseph's is because the people who come here usually take one or more of us away. That's what we don't like. If they just bring us candy and things and leave us all here, I don't suppose we'd mind at all. Would we, Benny? No, we wouldn't. But I do want you to come and live with me, Eddie, the stranger told him after a moment. Eddie was amazed at the words, but found his breath to reply. No, I can't go. You see, Mother Rose has me sing in the chapel, and I have to take care of little Ben here. He lost his friend today. I wish, he finished in an outburst, that you bad men would not come and take us away. That's all you come around here for. I'm not a bad man, my boy. Eddie and Ben both stood and stared at the man, and it was clear from their faces that they had no liking for him. But he was not going to give up that easily. I have a fine home where you can stay, he continued, and a lovely wife who would be very happy to be a dear mother to you. That is my big auto down there at the gate. When you get old enough, I will teach you to run it. Won't that be nice? Oh, I'm sure that you will like it very much with me. Just then, Eddie felt a jerk at his sleeve, and little Ben's voice whispered in his ear, Come on, Eddie, let's run and hide. I'm afraid that man is going to take you. Seeing that the boys were becoming alarmed, and fearing that the pleading of the small, yellow-haired chap might influence the sister in charge, the man left the lads and hurried to the main entrance. This visitor's name was Jackson. He had been carrying on a correspondence with the sisters, and had sent them testimonial letters signed with the names of two prominent men in the city, as well as others bearing the names of priests in towns nearby. 
It never occurred to the mother superior to question these testimonials, for there was absolutely no reason to doubt either the signatures of the local businessmen or those of the priests. All the letters spoke of Jackson's character in the most favorable terms. Hence, Mother Rose felt that there was nothing else to do but to wait for the man's arrival, and treat his request favorably, and now he was here. Had she known that Jackson himself had written all of these letters and forged the signatures, she certainly would not have had anything to do with the man. Come, Eddie, urged little Ben. Let's go and hide under the side porch. The tall flowers growing near it will keep us from getting caught. I know that ugly old fellow will try his best to get you, and I don't believe what he said about his home. Without waiting for an answer, Benny caught Eddie by the arm, and the two bounded off to the shelter of the porch and the flowers. Happily, they settled down in the darkness and quiet, for surely no one would think to look for them there. My, it's very dark here, whispered Eddie into Ben's ear. Yes, but after your eyes get used to it, it won't be nearly so dark. I've been under here before. You're right, Benny. I can see some better already. Not so loud, replied the boy in a low voice, and go further back. Keep your hand on the ground so you can tell where you're going. I don't know whether there are any big holes under here or not, but if you are careful, you'll be able to feel them. We are far enough now. Okay. We'll have to stay here for a long time, for Mother Rose will have the kids looking for us, whispered Eddie. What's that? It sounds like Mother Rose. Be very quiet now. Just then Jackson's voice broke in upon the stillness of the afternoon. They're around here, sister. I saw them go this way just as soon as I got through talking to them. I want the dark-headed boy. He had a smaller boy with him when I spoke to him. The dark-headed boy, said Mother Rose. You don't mean my little Eddie, do you? Yes, that's the one. I remember now. He did tell me that his name was Eddie. He is our singer, Mother Rose responded. We have been teaching him music for more than a year now, and he is a great comfort to us. We shall miss him very much if he goes with you. The other little fellow he had with him was quite a bit younger than Eddie, I believe. Yes, his new pal, Benny. Benny, repeated the man. Yes, that's what he told me. I nearly forgot what it was. Benny. I sent them out a few minutes ago to see our new puppies. Little Ben has just lost his old pal and is quite downhearted about it. You know how boys are. Yes, yes. The boys under the porch were listening. Just what I told you, Eddie, whispered Benny. He says he wants you. Now you see we'll have to stay here. I knew he wanted me right from the start, replied Eddie in a troubled undertone. You'd think by the way we talked to him that he'd have sense enough to know we didn't care for him, wouldn't you? But those people are all that way, little Ben told him. I remember how it has been when others came here. But Mother would like to keep us if she could, Eddie said. Benny nodded. After a little while he whispered, let's take a peek out. The two lads beneath the porch peered through the flocks and got a glimpse of the sister and the stranger. They were coming very near the porch now. Anxiously, Ben clutched Eddie's arm. Don't make any noise, Eddie, he begged. I won't, the older boy promised in an almost soundless whisper. That man wants you, Benny went on, but I can't let you go. You're the only friend I have now. I thought you said I shouldn't talk, Eddie smiled at the boy. How about you? I know it, but I can't help it. I don't want to go with them, Ben. He looks very cranky. Mother Rose now stood beside the step, and for a moment the boys held their breath in fear. Oh, Eddie. Benny relaxed a little. They're gone around the corner now. I saw them, Ben. We must stay here and not make a sound, said Benny. They'll never find us. If Mother Rose calls us, don't answer. That isn't a very good thing to do, and I know she won't like it when we tell her, but we just have to do it. She'll forgive us, replied Eddie. I never did anything like this on her before, did you? asked Benny. Oh, no. Even as the boys were making these plans, a sound suddenly came from the porch above. Someone was evidently in the doorway, perhaps had heard them. The thought made Eddie shudder, and little Ben turned to him with a big question in his eyes. Sister Teresa, cried Mother Rose's voice from a little distance, and now from the porch directly above they heard the response. Yes, Mother. Ben poked Eddie in the ribs in sharp alarm. Have you seen anything of Eddie and Benny, sister? Yes, Mother. A short time ago I heard some voices down there among the flowers. I'll hurry right down and see if I can find them for you. 
The patter of the feet above warned the boys that the sister was descending to look for them. Benny was so excited that his teeth chattered, and in the dim light he could see that Eddie's face was pale. "'We're done for now,' said Eddie. "'Go over in that dark corner under the steps,' whispered Benny. "'Crawl on your hands and knees, and I'll come over too, just as soon as I can. I know they'll never be able to find us there. It's as black as night. Sister Teresa's got mighty good eyesight. "'Hurry!' was Benny's only response. Had it not been for the noise the sister made on the stones with her heels, she would surely have heard a thump on the wooden steps, for Benny, in his excitement, struck his head sharply against them. Suddenly there she was, pushing aside the plants and gazing through. She shifted from place to place, striving to pierce the darkness, but in vain. "'Eddie!' she called in the sweet soprano voice, for which Sister Teresa was well known. But Eddie did not answer. It was the first time that he had heard a sister call him and made no reply. Even in the midst of his fear, his conscience heard him. "'Don't move,' breathed Benny. The boys could tell by the rustling of the plants that the sister was leaving, but before they could express their relief, a voice from a window near the porch called out a, "'Hello!' in greeting to her. Thinking that the voice was Eddie's, she looked up quickly, only to observe two other lads watching her. "'Have you been there long?' she inquired. "'Just a few minutes, sister,' said one. "'Do you want us to do something for you, sister?' asked the other boy. "'Have you seen anything of Eddie and Benny? We have been looking for them a long time. I don't know where they could have gone.' The boys assured Sister Teresa that they had not seen their missing friend since lunch. "'I wish that you would look all through the house and see if you can find them,' directed the sister. "'Tell them to come to the office at once, as there is someone to see them. Will you?' "'Yes, sister, we'd be glad to help you.' Thinking it was the two youngsters she had now enlisted in the search, whom she had heard talking in the first place, Sister Teresa returned to Mother Rose. "'I'm sorry, Mother. I cannot find Eddie and Benny, though I have two of the boys helping me. Eddie cannot be far away, and where he is, of course we will find the little boy. It is strange how they seem to have vanished.' "'Very well, Sister,' replied Mother Rose. "'I have just told Mr. Jackson to return in the morning, as we would not let Eddie go today in any event, you know.' "'You know,' she continued, turning to the man, "'he is to sing in the chapel tonight, "'and we could not do without him on this occasion. "'Mother General is to be here at five. "'It would be absolutely impossible for us "'to prepare another program before that time, "'but I'm sorry the boy isn't here now. "'I did want you two to get really acquainted today.' "'I'll be here at nine in the morning,' answered Jackson. "'I don't think I'd care for any of the other boys, "'but this little Eddie reminds me of my own son, "'who died a year ago.' I am sure Mrs. Jackson will like the lad very much. She was so devoted to our little Charles, but the good Lord took him away from us. Mrs. Jackson really never recovered from the shock. About a month ago, she had a complete nervous breakdown and is just beginning to show signs of improvement. I thought it would be a help to her to have a child of about the same size as our boy. It might assist her to forget. I am sure she will like little Eddie, said Mother Rose warmly. He is such a good boy and very talented. I think he has a great musical career ahead of him. We have been giving him lessons on the piano and violin, and one of our sisters is training his voice. If he lives with you, I do hope he will be allowed to continue taking lessons. We have never met such a remarkable child. He shall be given every opportunity money can obtain, Jackson reassured her. Mrs. Jackson is fond of music, and is in fact quite a musician herself. But until she recovers, do you think the sisters would continue to give him lessons? I could bring him here for them, you know. I am sure they would be delighted to do so. That will be fine, Jackson said. You must come and see us some day. We would be delighted to have you call when you're in the city. If I ever get the opportunity, I will do so, Mother Rose told him. But it is very seldom that we have a chance to get away from our work here. There are so few of us to do all that is to be done. We could use many more sisters. These were all lies that Jackson had been telling the good sister. He was not a Catholic, although he had professed to be a very devout one, nor was there any Mrs. Jackson. He had a miserable hut in the slum district of the city, where he kept four boys whom he had procured from various charitable institutions, and had subsequently trained to pocket-picking, shoplifting, and such-like employments. Now he wanted another lad and was working his old schemes on the unwary sisters. He knew that they were very poor, and therefore would be glad to place any boys out if a good opportunity presented itself. It was a very easy matter for him to assume a false front. Devils always do that, that their true colors may not be known. 
The scamp now left rejoicing, despite the fact that he had not at once obtained what he desired. He had at least made the sisters believe that Eddie was going to a fine home, and after all, that was as far as their care had to extend, though their interest in a lad did not cease with his departure. Had Eddie known where he was going, he would not have come from beneath the porch, although it was past supper time. That old fellow must be off by now, or he'll be as hungry as we are, said little Ben. I wonder what Mother Rose will say to us when she sees us. What shall we tell her? I'll tell her I didn't want to go with that cranky-looking man, and I'm sure she won't scold us, replied Eddie. I have a pain in my stomach, said Benny dolefully. Why, Eddie and Benny, came Mother Rose's voice. Where have you been? I have been looking for you for nearly four hours. A man wanted, wanted to take my Eddie away, Mother Rose, and, and I told him to hide, quavered Benny. We have been under the porch for a long, long time, haven't we, Eddie? We were there when Sister Teresa looked under, but we didn't say anything to her. Why, my dear boys, you have worried me very much, Mother Rose said. Mother General is here and everyone is in the refectory. Go up and wash now and hurry down to supper. You are quite late already. No slight commotion was caused in the dining room as Mother Rose entered, and the climax was reached when a few minutes later the two lads made their appearance in the doorway. They were questioned on all sides, but they were too hungry to answer. The pain Benny complained of must be stopped first. Questions could be answered any time. Eddie was just putting a large spoonful of beans into his mouth, when one of the boys said, "'You're going away tomorrow, Eddie. I heard Mother Rose tell Sister Teresa.' "'No, he ain't,' shouted Benny above the tumult of voices. "'We will run away first, won't we, Eddie?' Mother Rose heard this, and leaning toward the Mother General, whispered something to her. "'So that's Eddie, your little songbird, is it?' said the kindly nun. "'God bless him.' "'Yes,' replied Mother Rose. "'He'll sing for you tonight.' End of chapter 2 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 3 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 3 Winning Warbles after supper was over, the boys hastily washed and prepared themselves for evening services. All were anxious to hear little Eddie sing. Not that it was an extraordinary thing for them to do so, but because they all realized it was the last time, perhaps, that they would have the opportunity, for their little friend was to leave in the morning. There was no jealousy among these boys, such as is often found when one seems to be better liked than the others. On the contrary, they all were happy to think that they had Eddie among them, and sorrowed only because he was leaving. That attitude was the result of their training. The sisters led lives of constant sacrifice themselves, and they instilled into the lives of their charges a like spirit of humility and love of others. This evening the boys did not engage in the usual recreations. There was something sad in the atmosphere about the place. Here and there little groups were gathered but scarcely a sound could be heard. The summer sun was lowering, and the deep reddish glow, together with the soft breeze of the evening, made the lads a little drowsy. Then, too, the mental depression that each felt was conductive to quietness. "'What? No games tonight?' asked Sister Teresa, who knew only too well what the trouble was. "'No, I don't feel like playing tonight, sister,' responded a little dark-complexioned lad who sat on a porch swing." "'Where is Benny?' asked Sister Teresa suddenly. "'I haven't seen him for some time, sister.' "'Well, you'll have to help cheer him up if Eddie goes,' the sister told them. "'Benny's having a hard time keeping his pals.' Eddie was not seen among his friends, for there were but a few minutes now before the chapel bell would call them all in for services. The altar candles were burning, some of the phlox blossoms behind which the two lads had hidden themselves in the afternoon were now upon the altar. Down in one of the front pews sat little Benny, patiently waiting for the priest to come upon the scene. Then the bell rang. The orphan boys passed into their places, and a few minutes later, Mother Rose, leading the Mother General, walked down the middle aisle and sat just behind little Ben. Now all was quiet for a moment. The servers and the priests passed into the sanctuary. The altar was arranged, and after a profound genuflection on the part of priests and acolytes, 
the Eucharistic king was exposed for the adoration of his little ones. How Jesus loved these, his children! It must have reminded his sacred heart of the time when he had to forbid his disciples to send the little ones away. And what prayers must have welled up from these small hearts to the God of tenderness and love! We cannot imagine a place where Jesus would more delight to dwell than here, among his poor little orphans. Did not he himself say, For of such is the kingdom of heaven? A grand flood of notes burst from the organ. A thrill ran through the assembly. A moment's silence, followed by another passionate burst of music. Perfect silence once more. Then a clear, silvery note, softly swelling until the vaulted ceiling re-echoed the sound, and Eddie was unconsciously bringing all hearts closer to Jesus. O salutaris hostia, vecili pontis hostium. Then the soft notes of the organ could be heard accompanying the wondrous strains. Tears came to Mother Rose's eyes. When had Eddie ever sung so sweetly? How she hated to part with him. Could Jackson not take one of the other little boys? This was indeed a cross for the sister. But after a moment's sorrow, she told herself she must accept and bear it for the sake of what Jesus had borne when he left his blessed mother to go out into the cruel world to suffer and to die for us. Nor was Mother Rose the only one who wept. Tears streamed down the other sister's cheeks, and even Father Smith felt a thrill in his priestly heart to which he could not give expression. Heretofore he had deeply enjoyed the child's singing, but that was all. Now, ah, perhaps he would never hear his little friend again. That was the cause of his emotion. This benediction he would offer up for Eddie, that the boy should always remain a devout Catholic through whatever trials might come upon him. And greatly did Eddie need this blessing. Who would have dreamed of the terrible things that he must yet suffer? Usually the other choir boys joined in with their leader at the second stanza and sang the whole of the Tanta Mergo in unison. But it was to be their last chance to hear the little songbird, and Mother Rose had told him to sing both hymns alone. We The clear, sweet voice sang Termino, the end. He held that note as if, child though he was, he knew how applicable his prayer was to the occasion. The sound lowered almost beyond hearing. The organ throbbed and hushed to patria. Then once more his voice rose to its highest pitch, gradually swelling and dying away. The moving appeal, O oh, grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee, made Mother Rose falter briefly in her resolution. Well, she would have loved to keep Eddie, but the mount's income was small, and Jackson would have none of the other children. Mother Rose, therefore, felt obliged to consent to the boys leaving. It was a very difficult matter for her to get sufficient funds to keep up the orphanage, and it was her duty though it often went against her will, to let the boys go whenever a good Catholic home could be procured for them. Nor was it often that anyone came to adopt a child. People in general seem to be too much given to selfish pleasure ever to think of bringing up children who are not their own. If such people would only remember the words of Christ, telling them that whatever they do for one of his least brethren, they do for him, things might be very different for orphaned little ones. After benediction was over, Mother Rose and the Mother General walked out upon the veranda. Mother Rose, said the older nun, in all my experience with children, I have never heard one of them sing like that. If that voice develops properly later on, Eddie will be a grand opera singer. He does have a marvelous voice, Mother General. We have been watching it carefully. We do hope he will become famous, for we greatly need the aid of important people if we are to continue our good work here. Would you mind sending for the boy, Mother Rose? I'd like to have a talk with him. Mother Rose called one of the orphans and told him to find Eddie for her. 
and within a couple of minutes the boy stood before them. "'You have a wonderful voice, my dear child,' the mother general told him. "'Take good care of it. It is a gift from God. If you have the opportunity, develop it. Take lessons from a good teacher.' Just then Sister Adelaide appeared on the scene. "'Sister Adelaide,' the mother general turned to her, "'you are a great musician. I understand you have been teaching Eddie.' "'Yes, mother, I have, but I have come here to tell you that you are wanted on the phone.' The busy nun arose. "'I hope to hear from you again, Eddie,' she addressed the child in leave-taking. "'God bless you.' And with that, Mother General and Sister Adelaide left, and Eddie stood there with good Mother Rose. "'When you leave us, Eddie,' said Mother Rose earnestly, "'be sure to pray hard and to receive Holy Communion as often as possible.' It is by that means, especially, that you will get strength to fight against the enemies of your salvation. I would like to promise to go to Holy Communion every morning, Mother, as I have been doing here, but I don't know whether I will be living where I can do it, and I wouldn't like to make a promise I couldn't keep. I'll not ask you to promise that, Eddie, but I will ask you to promise me not to forget to say your three Hail Marys every night for our dear lady's protection. That I'll promise, Mother. I have never forgotten them since you first told me, and I feel sure that I never will. You know, dear child, that I would like to keep you here with us, continued Mother Rose, but Mr. Jackson insists upon having you, and I'm afraid I'll have to let you go. I'm sure you'll have a nice place, and you can come to see me at any time. Remember, you can always call St. Joseph your home, and Mother Rose your mother. I would like to stay for Benny's sake, Eddie said. Then, too, I'm afraid of Mr. Jackson, Mother. I have seen very few men in my lifetime that I remember, but this one looks cruel to me. Didn't you notice his eyes? I must say I didn't, Eddie. What was different about them? He never looked at anyone when he was talking to them. His eyes shifted most of the time. Mother Rose was a little disturbed by these words, but she remembered that it was only a child speaking, and she put down his feeling to his sorrow at leaving. However, she said, Remember this, my child, you can always come back to us if you are not well treated. No matter where you are, let me know, and I'll send for you. Mount St. Joseph will never turn you away. I'm glad of that, mother, replied Eddie gratefully, and very thankful for all that you have done for me. You and the other sisters have been very good to me and to all the boys. We may not say it often, but we appreciate it. When you are a man and earning a living for yourself, said Mother Rose, smiling at him. I hope that you will remember this place and help us in our need. I will surely remember the good sisters, he promised. With that, Mother Rose bade Eddie good night, and he, noticing the time, made off to the dormitory. There he found that most of his playmates had already prepared for bed. That night, Eddie had a dream. He found himself in a fine home with a large lawn on which pretty flowers, pansies, lilies, and even large crimson flocks were artistically arranged in spacious beds. Birds of many kinds, robins, wrens, larks, finches, sang in the trees, and a bright fountain played in a nearby grove. But where was this beautiful home? It seemed in some way familiar to him, and yet he could not say definitely where he was. But better than the fine surroundings was a sweet lady whom, in the dream, he knew to be his mother. And in the same way as before, the poor child seemed to recognize her. Now she was leading him through the garden to a large swing. There, drawing him to her side, she spoke lovingly to him and told him of his father, who had been killed. Pray for Daddy every day. He may need our prayers far more than we think. I will pray for him, Mama. I will always remember him. In his dream, poor little Eddie tried to recall a masculine face. He was just about to ask the lovely lady what his father's name was, when he felt something pressing his arm, and a voice said, "'What is the matter, Eddie?' He opened his eyes, and there stood Mother Rose. It was time to get up, but for a moment the boy did not know where he was. "'Oh, Mother, I have been dreaming of my home, of Papa and Mama. I wonder where they are. I have not dreamed of them for so long now, but they seem so real.' Then Benny's voice could be heard. "'Is Eddie going away already?' "'No, lad, he must go to Mass and have breakfast first. "'Mr. Jackson said he would be here at nine o'clock. "'I'll be ready in time, Mother,' Eddie promised. "'But Benny broke in with, 
Oh, mother, please, please let Eddie stay with me. He's the only friend I have now that Tom has left. You said he could stay with me. I know it, Benny, she tried to comfort the little boy, but Mother Rose cannot help it. You know I would like to have him stay, but what can I do? I would like to keep you all. Don't cry, Benny, put in Eddie. Perhaps some nice lady will come to get you soon, and then you'll be happy. Won't that be nice? No, said Benny flatly. I don't want to go. Not even with nice people? No, Benny was very emphatic. The time passed quickly, and shortly after nine o'clock, Mr. Jackson called. Both Eddie and Benny saw him come up to the office. For a moment they thought of hiding again, but they sensed that it would do no good. Then Jackson stood before them. "'So you are all ready to go with me, my little lad,' he said in a voice he strove to make agreeable. "'Mrs. Jackson was delighted when I told her that I was able to get a boy who looks so much like our own child. You cannot imagine how happy you will make her.' and she is badly in need of comfort. She has suffered so much since our time of bereavement. But I don't like to leave Mother Rose, Mr. Jackson, said Eddie honestly. I like it so much right here. But you will surely like it with me, too, Eddie. You don't know what a nice place we have. Tears came to Eddie's eyes, though he tried his best to keep them back. Benny, too, was crying, but he made no effort to conceal it. These boys certainly like each other, don't they? Mother Rose, said the man with a good imitation of sympathy. There is a wonderful family spirit here, Mr. Jackson, replied the warm-hearted sister. Don't cry, Benny, Jackson said to the little boy. Eddie can come to see you sometime. We have the car and can easily run down to get you. As soon as Mrs. Jackson is able to be out again, we shall often drive past here and can take you along for a ride if Mother Rose is willing to let you go. To be sure he can go, Mr. Jackson, replied Mother Rose happily. Just let me know at any time, and I'll have him ready. The final arrangements were made for Eddie's departure. The papers were drawn up and signed in the presence of Mother Rose, Father Smith, and a lady known to the sisters, who happened to be visiting the mount at the time. It was with the deepest sorrow that the boy tore himself from the sisters and from the other lads, especially Benny, who was inconsolable. I'll come to see you again some day, Benny. Goodbye. With that, Eddie was off into a world he little dreamed of, and one into which Mother Rose, with all her wide experience, had never put her foot. If she had but known what Eddie was to face, no consideration could have induced her to let him go. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 4 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 4 New Ways. Before Eddie became fully conscious of the fact, Mount St. Joseph and the happy day spent there in the company of the good sisters and his little pals were things of the past. How he hated to leave! Moreover, he feared the future though he had not the least idea of the environment into which he was to be thrown. Nor had Mother Rose, though she thought she had good reason to believe it would at least be conducive to happiness and morality. Had she but known the truth. Mother Rose's words, Remember this, my child, you can always come back to us if you are not well treated. No matter where you are, let me know and I'll send for you, were now whirling through Eddie's mind. They were a sort of consolation to him. The machine in which our little friend rode with the now tight-lipped and lowering Jackson carried him far beyond any path that he knew. Except for an occasional visit to town with one of the sisters, the walls around the orphanage had enclosed his world. This was a great change for him. He watched the trees fly past him and noticed that they became fewer as the cars went on. "'We're away from the pretty streets, aren't we, mister?' Jackson looked at him out of the corner of his eye. Yes, pretty streets or no pretty streets, it's all the same to you now. Don't worry about the streets being pretty. There are other things to notice. See those costly homes where the miserly rich live? See what wonderful places they have? You know how they get that way, don't you? The voice was very harsh, and Eddie was unaccustomed to being thus addressed. He felt chilled through and did not answer. They steal it from poor people, make them work long hours, and pay them very little. 
You must help me get even with them. You'll have to steal from them. But don't talk now. Wait till we get home. Of course it is not true that all the rich are miserly or unjust. And equally, of course, this evil man did not really care about poor people whose working hours were long and whose pay was small. He spoke in this way to every new member of his gang as a sort of justification for the life of crime to which he introduced them. Bewildered and afraid, Eddie leaned back in the seat and began to cry. I don't want to go with you, mister. Stop this thing. Let me out, please. I won't steal from these people, for that isn't right. Let me out. Shut up or I'll knock your teeth out, said Jackson grimly. Remember, I'm your boss now, not those simple-minded black gowns up there on the hill. You'll get used to me before long, or I'll know the reason. Jackson kept his eyes straight ahead on the road. Don't talk like that about the sisters, mister. They are not simple-minded. You're supposed to be a Catholic. Is that the way you... I, a Catholic? Ha ha! With a sneering laugh, this pretense of a gentleman, who in reality was the greatest crook in the city, gave Eddie a slap which knocked him against the side of the seat. Take that, you brat, and you'll get more before I get through with you, said Jackson furiously. I'll teach you how to talk to me. I take no nonsense from anybody. You'll hear more about that, too. For some time after Eddie received this blow on the face, he was totally unconscious of all that went on around him. When he came to, he found himself in a dirty room, one of several in a crumbling old house, unfit for human habitation. Surrounding him were four other boys, three of them larger than himself. A fourth, a pallet child of about nine, a year beyond Eddie's own age, was much smaller. The boys were listening to Jackson, whose voice was the first thing Eddie noted as he gained control of his faculties once more. Here's another cub, the little smarty I told you about last night. Jackson was saying. He ran away from the sisters and hid under the porch, thinking that I'd not come back for him or would take someone else. But I know my man when I see him. This one has an angelic-looking face that will be our fortune when we get him trained. And be sure that you get along with him, or I'll give you all a beating. But now to business, the man continued. Al, turning to one of the larger boys, you go up to that store today and see that you don't come back without the watch. It's in the same place where it was when I told you to get it. If you get caught while you're at it, keep your mouth shut about the rest of us, and I'll see to it that you don't go to jail. Get me? Al nodded assent. Bill, to another of the larger boys, you take a nap right after dinner, for you'll have to be up and wide awake tonight. Do you hear? This is a very important job for you, and I want you to be in the best of condition. It will mean more to us than anything else we have done. Understand? Yes. Well, beat it. Don't stand there looking at me. Jackson went over to one corner and sat down addressing the last of the older boys as he did so. Main Street is filled with shoppers by this time, Chuck. Why aren't you gone? Are you beginning to lie down on the job? Do you want to feel the weight of that club again? Get out of here at once, and mind you have something tonight, or you'll get no supper, and a sound thrashing besides. You're getting as lazy as a tramp, but don't worry, I have means of curing that. Chuck put on his cap and left by the back door. It was plain to see he believed everything that Jackson had told him. Then turning to the youngest of the boys, Dad, for so he made the lads call him, said, Tim, you take Ed here along with you and show him where you get coal and other things in the railroad yards. And mind, don't you get caught. Never say a word to anyone about me or where you hang out at. Do you hear? I'll cut your throat if you do and burn you. And you, Ed, turning a threatening face to his latest recruit, don't you get caught either, or you'll get put in a big black jail with nothing to eat. Remember I told you what I'd do, and if you want to try me out, well, just disobey one of my rules and you'll see. Eddie was about to say something to Dad, but Tim jerked his sleeve violently, and the boy realized just in time what that meant. So Tim took his new charge, whom he felt sure he would like very well when they got acquainted, and started for the freight yards. For the past five months, Tim had been supplying the house with coal, during this time, he had been learning the ins and outs of the profession of thievery, and it proved very satisfactory, according to Dad's way of reckoning. Tim was not bad at heart, and often regretted that he had to do this, stealing, but he was too much afraid of Dad to refuse. "'I don't see how you can do it, Tim.' "'I don't like this job, Eddie,' Tim replied. "'I know it's not right, but whatever Dad says you'd better do, or he'll beat you black and blue like he did me once. See those marks on my head?' 
I got him from him. I didn't get any supper last night because I didn't get coal enough. If you see anybody in the train yards, beat it, because if anyone gets you, you'll get put in a big black jail, Dad says, and he knows, for he's been in them and told us about them. See where that smoke is way over there? The youngster continued. That's where we have to go. I have to get four big bags full every day, or I'll catch it when Dad comes back at night. Don't have to get any this morning, because I have to show you around. We have a lot in our cellar, but I have to get some every day, so if anything should happen, we'd have plenty on hand. Many days during the winter, it's too cold to go out. You know it is a sin to steal, don't you? asked Eddie. Yes, Eddie, I know it is, for I used to be a Catholic once. But since I live with Dad, I don't go to church any more. He says it isn't good for us to go to church. And do you believe that? I really don't know, Eddie, but what can a feller do? Don't you even go to church on Sunday? Eddie persisted. Nope, responded Tim. Sunday is just the same as any other day with us. Most times I don't know when Sunday comes, unless I get to go downtown and then find the stores closed. I don't get downtown very often, though. The other fellers do the work there. For me, it's only coal, 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 morning, noon, and night. I get so I can see coal in my sleep. Then you don't go to confession, either? inquired Eddie. No, Tim admitted. I don't know when I was to confession last. I'd be scared to go now. Scared? What would you be scared of? The priest. Why, he wouldn't hurt you. I know, replied Tim, but I'd be scared just the same. But do you like to stay with this man, Tim? asked Eddie, puzzled. No, I don't like him at all, but you mustn't say anything to him about it or he'll get after me, and I don't want any more beatings. It was very clear that Tim was in mortal fear of Dad. Let's run away from him, broke from Eddie. He's not your father, is he? No, he got me from a home, the boy answered. I ain't any relation to him, but I have to stay, he says, or he'll find me and kill me. I'd like to skip, but gee, I'd get caught sure. It seems you can't do a thing without he knows it. He should have been a detective or something. Eddie could see that Tim meant it. Did you ever try to run away, Tim? He asked. Yes, and I got an awful beating. I had to stay in bed for three days. I was sore all over. Don't let them other boys hear you talking about leaving, or they'll tell on you. They told on me because they didn't like me. Do they like you now? No, I don't think so, was Tim's response. We don't pay no attention to each other. Each one gets all he can for himself but they'll squeal on you if they think they can get in good with Dad. But I don't do that. I just take care of my own skin. You learn that after a while. Just don't try to make up to them. By this time the boys had reached their destination, and Tim began showing Eddie holes in the fence, places where they could hide if someone should chase them, and other places where he usually got his supply of coal. Suddenly a man came upon the scene, and Tim whispered something in Eddie's ear. What's a cop, Tim? was Eddie's reply. He had never heard the word before. Beat it. Come on, run before he sees us. I don't see anyone except that fellow there by the post, said Eddie. Is he a cop? Yes, a cop's a policeman, and a policeman's a guy that takes you to jail. Oh, answered Eddie, enlightened. I know what a policeman is, but I never heard them called cops before. Well, you'll hear plenty of other names for them before long. While they were thus discussing the nature of cops, Tim was making rapidly for a hiding place while Eddie ran along beside him. It was an old shanty in which kegs of railroad spikes were kept, and by a special arrangement of some of these kegs, Tim had contrived a secure place of refuge. All he had to do now was to pull one of them aside, and the boys were in a sort of cave, for the small barrels lined the retreat on all sides, and the second tier covered the top. "'How do you know how long to stay in here, Tim?' inquired Eddie, after he had taken all of this in. How can you tell when the cop's gone? Well, Tim pointed as he spoke, you'll find a stick nailed to the wall over there. If you push that stick aside from the bottom, you can see through a knot in the board. Try it. You've got to know these things. Say, that's clever, spoke up Eddie in admiration. Did you fix it up this way, Tim? Yes. Can you see the cop, Eddie? No, I can't see anyone. I can see the post where he was but there is no one near it. That's fine, said Tim. Don't forget about this place. We'll go now. I just wanted to show it to you. You may have to use it sometime, for there are always cops around here, but they would never think of looking in here for you. 
but we don't have to hurry away from here do we eddie did not want to go i'd rather be out here than home with dad and those kids we don't have to hurry exactly but there are other places you might have to skid into some time let's go and see a couple of them so out of their cave the two came move that keg over the entrance now tim directed or there'll be no use having this place once it is found out you might just as well forget about it eddie put the keg in place and the boys made their way from the shack we'll go down there near the coal bins was tim's decision some days there aren't enough stray pieces lying along the tracks and you may have to go right up to the bins most times there are more men out in the yards they'll all holler at you at times but you'll get used to that see those ties lying over there yes eddie's gaze followed the pointing finger well let's go over to em i got another hideout over there it's a good one too soon the two had reached the spot where new railroad ties were piled waiting to be used come around this side ordered tim see here where two piles meet they've been here a long time the ground has caved in under some of them pull on that bottom one and see what happens it isn't dangerous is it nope tim reassured him watch me oh i'll pull it tim said eddie hastily i just wanted to be on the safe side he gave the tie a jerk as tim had told him to do and to his amazement there was a hole in the ground big enough for him to get into it's from a washout the other boy explained get into the hole now and see if you can pull the tie back in place you see you have to be sure to do that or those everlasting cops will find it tim watched while eddie got into the hole and closed the opening as directed that's the way he said approvingly all right now come on those two are the best after a while you can make places for yourself you should get to know a few of them cause you never can tell when you'll need one soon the two lads were on their way back to the house eddie did not talk much for despite the friendliness which had grown up between them he did not altogether trust his companion then too he was beginning to think out a plan of escape he knew he could not get used to this kind of life it was strange and horrible to him and his whole nature rebelled against it he would watch his opportunity and at the first chance he would make off where to he did not care someone would be able to direct him back to mount st joseph but for the time being he was eddie of jackson's gang end of chapter four recording by maria therese chapter five of eddie of jackson's gang by brother ernest ryan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 5 A Strange Night. When the boys got back to the house, it was deserted. Tim thought nothing of this, for it was the usual thing. But Eddie found it very odd indeed. He had been accustomed to living where there were many cheerful boys who liked to have their fun, and who had it. Now he was in a place where there was seldom anyone at home and when they were there, little was said except what was wicked. "'That was quite a long walk, wasn't it?' observed Tim. "'But you'll get used to it if Dad gives that to you for your job. He may do that and give me something else to do. Once in a while we change about.' "'But I'd hate to have that to do,' Eddie replied. "'Yes, but Dad never asked us what we like,' Tim instructed him, "'and if you are wise, you'll keep your face shut about it.' "'What time do the boys and Dad come home?' asked eddie after a moment that's hard to say eddie i never know when they'll pull in sometimes they come home in time for supper but generally they get in after i've gone to bed who cooks the supper for you inquired eddie curiously when we have a cook supper we all help tim answered but it's seldom we have anything except coffee and bread or rolls the other boys usually get something out of lunchroom and they don't bother about me so there are no cooked meals Eddie could hardly believe it. Almost never, but, Tim was philosophical, that means no dishes either. I hate to do dishes. I guess I wouldn't be a boy if I didn't. Well, I never had to do the dishes, but I don't think I'd mind it if I got a good meal first, Eddie told him. Well, I usually manage to eat twice a day, but we don't even talk about meals here, Eddie. This was certainly a strange place, Eddie reflected drearily. He had been used to having his three regular meals, frugal though they were. He must now begin to lead a new life, as long as he stayed with Jackson. He hoped that would not be long. Somehow he must get away. 
he could not imagine how little Tim put up with the place. He turned that question over and over in his mind. As for himself, why should he stay in a place where he was compelled to do wrong, when there were places where he would be helped to do right? Why should he stay where he didn't get enough to eat, when there were places where he could get enough? Why should he not get out of here and find Mount St. Joseph and Mother Rose? Suddenly the force of his thoughts and the fact that he had had no food for many hours made Eddie dizzy. Are you going to make any coffee tonight, Tim? he asked. I am very hungry. I'm not going to make any new, but I'll heat up what was left from dinner. There is some in the pot, and there is bread and butter here. Dad says we shouldn't eat much for supper, for it will make us dream. I don't want to dream, because I usually dream about my home and Mama. Do you remember your Mama, Tim? Yes, Eddie, and she was so good to me. Tim's voice showed he was near tears. The reason why she died was because Pop was so mean to her. He used to come home drunk most every night and beat her. She went out to work every day, doing washing and ironing for rich people. It took all the money she could earn to pay the rent and feed us kids. Mama ate very little, for she wanted to give as much as she could to us. She got very thin, and at last she wasn't able to go to work any more. Then a big wagon came and took her away to a hospital. They were good to her there. They put her in a nice little white bed, and the doctor and sisters took care of her. I used to go and see her most every day. One day I went there, and Mama began to cry. There were two doctors there and a couple of nurses. Mama told me to be a good boy after she was gone. Then the sister took me away from her, and I didn't see her until the next day, and she was in a coffin. Oh, your poor mother died? Yes, Eddie, said Tim, wiping away the tears that at last began to fall, and they put her in the cold, wet ground, and I've been lonesome for her ever since. Well, I don't blame you for that, Tim. It's all right to be lonesome for your mother. Then they put me in a home, Tim continued. Was it Mount St. Joseph? No, Eddie, I don't remember the name. Were the sisters in charge of the home? No, there were no sisters. There were women in charge, but they were not sisters. I was in a Protestant home. And did you like it there, Tim? asked Eddie. It was fine, said Tim enthusiastically. We had a little work to do. We had such good meals. Mrs. Brannigan did the cooking for us. She was great. She had great big pockets in her skirts, and I think she always had them stuffed with cookies. If she would meet us any place around the school, and there were none of the bosses around, she'd give us a cookie. She put her big fat finger up to her lips when she gave it to us and say, shh. We all knew what that meant. And did you have to study there? Yes, but, Tim admitted, I wasn't so hot at it. Studying me never got along. I'm just a plain dumbbell when it comes to lessons. But I don't think you are to blame for that, Tim, Eddie came to his defense. Mother Rose often told us that when boys don't have the proper care and nourishment while growing up, they don't make very good students. Of course, I never had much of either, said Tim, but I think I'd be just plain dumb no matter what I had. Dad thinks that way about me. That's why he gives me the job to get the coal. What would you like to do? Well, I'd like to take a whack at grabbing a few diamonds or something like that. But why, Tim? Eddie could scarcely trust his ears. Just to see if I could do it. I might get treated better around here if I could. Oh, you don't want to be stealing things, Tim said Eddie. Well, what are you going to do about it? demanded Tim. It's that or a beaten. He put the coffee pot on the stove and brought out a little bread, and the two sat down to a very slender bite before they went to bed. You take this piece, Eddie, said Tim generously. It's a little bigger than the other one. I had something to eat at noon, but you haven't had anything since breakfast, have you? No, Tim. Eddie took the larger piece gratefully. It's very kind of you to do this. Oh, that's all right. They ate in silence until the last crumb was gone. Then Tim arose. Well, we'll go to bed now. It's best to get a lot of sleep, and it makes the time go faster, too. I hate to have to sit around very much, and Dad won't let us have anything to do with the kids around the neighborhood. He says our business won't allow us to get in with outsiders. It was a poor bed indeed that Eddie went to, but he did not care much about that. He was thinking about the history of Tim's family. 
and wondering what had happened to his own mother. There was only the one bed, so the two little waifs were obliged to sleep together. After they had settled down, Eddie began trying to persuade Tim to run away with him. "'Tomorrow Dad may let us go for the coal together,' he said. "'I don't think he would send me alone the first day. "'Well, we could pretend we were going, and then after we got out on the tracks, "'we could go up to one of the trainmen and ask him if he could tell us how to get to Mount St. Joseph.' "'Mount St. Joseph? That's a Catholic place.' "'Yes, Tim. What of it?' "'Gee,' was the response. "'I'd have to go to confession if I went there.' "'You wouldn't mind that, would you?' asked Eddie, puzzled. "'Gee, I don't know.' "'Well, even if we didn't go to Mount St. Joseph,' Eddie changed his attack a little, "'we could hop on a train, maybe, and get to some other city.' "'But what would we do when we got there?' asked Tim. "'We are too young to get a real job. "'Some policemen would round us up and put us in jail.' That's what Dad said. They don't put boys in jail who haven't done anything wrong, Tim, Eddie tried to reassure him. A policeman might find us when we got there, but he wouldn't keep us in jail. He'd take us to a home and try to find out something about us. That's just what Dad says. Try to find out something about us. We don't dare have anyone find out anything about us. We'd all get the pen then. Eddie was at his wit's end. I think you like this old place, Tim, he said. I don't either, but I can't help it. I'm here, and it seems I'll have to stay. Tim was silent a moment, then spoke determinedly. Let's go to sleep now. You'll feel different in the morning. Eddie felt that he could not sleep. He wished that his little pal would stay awake to talk with him, and thus help the long hours of the night to pass. But Tim was tired, and soon Eddie was awake alone. There came back to him scenes of the life at Mount St. Joseph, which already seemed far away. The busy, kind sisters, little Benny, his own little white bed. Where was St. Joseph's? He did not know, but it must be miles and miles away. Suddenly a thought came to him. He had not said his prayers. Without waiting a moment, he got out of bed and, kneeling on the floor, said an Our Father, a few Hail Marys, and a prayer to his guardian angel. Then he jumped back into bed and was soon asleep. It was sleep brought on by sheer weariness, for he had tried his best to keep it away. The dream Eddie had had the night before again passed before him, but combined with it was a troubled sense of all these newer happenings. What a contrast between that dream home and his present surroundings! The dear mother of his dream pressed him gently and tenderly to her breast once more, and then the dream changed. She was there no longer. Now, though still submerged in slumber, Eddie longed for Mother Rose, Sister Adelaide, the gentle musician, Sister Teresa, and all those who had been so kind to him. Even in his dream he knew he was in a den of thieves, in a filthy house which no one tried to keep in order. Its broken windows were patched with rags. Shreds of paper hung from the walls. The dirty floors were bare. The few sticks of furniture were falling apart. Eddie was sound asleep but his hands and feet were at work, a strange, unconscious activity. His dream had changed again. Anyone could have told by his movements that he was imagining someone was after him. Here he comes! Here he comes! What Tim had told him that day about cops was coming alive in his dream. Here he comes! shouted Eddie once more. Shut up there! Dad was home now and had heard the boy cry out in his sleep. Eddie did not hear the command but soon knew that Dad was beside him, for a heavy hand gave him a couple of slaps across the mouth. Eddie jumped up quickly, confused and afraid. You crazy brat! You'll wake up everybody! Don't you know our business calls for silence? Let me hear no more of this, or I'll give you a good beating. Nervous and trembling from the blows, and from this even more terrifying threat, Eddie once more began to think of how to make his escape. For over an hour he lay awake, turning plans over in his mind. Then, sure that everyone else was asleep, he arose, dressed himself, and was making his way out of the room when he heard a sound, as if someone were coming up the stairs. He stopped short and listened. Was it one of the bigger boys coming in? He knew only too well what would result from his being caught. What was he to do? The answering action came as quickly as the thought had come. Swiftly and quietly he hurried back to his bed, clothes and all, and now came another worry. He found the bed empty. Where was Tim? 
Had he been there when Eddie left a few minutes ago? These questions did not occupy him long, for he soon became aware that the person he had heard coming up the stairs was none other than Tim himself. Where have you been, Tim? Eddie asked in a whisper. Downstairs, getting something to eat. I woke up feeling very hungry, replied the other boy. Weren't you in bed when I got up? Yes, but as soon as you sat on the floor to fix your shoelaces, I got out on the other side. I thought you were going to try to escape, so I went down to stop you and to get some more to eat, added Tim, his mind still partly on food. Why did you come back so soon? I thought I heard Dad moving around, Tim explained, and I didn't want him to find me down there. Well, I'm not going to stay here very long, Tim, Eddie told him. I may run away tomorrow. I might just as well take a chance. You can't tell what you can do until you try. Well, if you think you won't get caught, go ahead. But, added Tim with a shiver, I'd hate to be you if you don't make it. I bet I'll get away. I wouldn't bet, Tim said. I know exactly what you'll get. I've seen some of the others get theirs. For running away? No, not for running away. Dad don't have special beatings for each thing. He just lays it on in the same way. And when I say lay it on, I mean it. No love taps. The welts show for days after. He must be a brute, whispered Eddie. He's worse than that, Tim assured him. He says when he gets mad he can't see straight, but I know he can see where to beat just the same. If he puts it on that way when he can't see, I'd hate to be the one getting it sometime when he can see. Boy. Tim. You'd better go to sleep now, advised Tim. It must be awfully late. Gee, I hate to sleep. But sleep again overtook them both. It ended for Tim as soon as daylight came and he awakened Eddie. It's time to get up, Eddie, he said, shaking him. I have to make the fire every morning because Dad says I do the least of anybody. Will you help me? It won't take very long. Sure, I'll be glad to help you, but I never had to make a fire before, so you'll have to show me what to do. It's not so bad in the summertime when you don't need a fire to warm the place, but it is mighty tough in the winter. What do you want me to do, Tim? Eddie asked as they went downstairs. I'll shake out the ashes while you go to the cellar for a bucket of coals. Don't make any noise. We do not want to wake up the others now. They'll be cranky enough when it comes time for them to get up. The fire was at last burning brightly. Then the coffee pot was put on the stove, and soon the old house was filled with odors. Smells pretty good, Tim, said Eddie. I hope it tastes half as good, don't you? Yes, here's some bread. Tim handed him a chunk. Better eat a little anyway before Dad and the others get up, or maybe you won't get very much. Sometimes I have to wait until dinner, except for what I get like this. You see, Dad thinks I do the least, and so I should eat the least. I have to work the hardest, really, but I bring in less money. That's what the boys say. And Eddie? Yes. Don't try to run away now. Wait a little while, won't you? End of chapter 5. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 6 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 6 A New Friend. Dad and the boys overslept this morning so after the coffee was made, the two chums sat down and had their morning bite. It was the first time in Eddie's existence that he had eaten from a bare table, and from dishes that were not clean. His thoughts drifted back to Mount St. Joseph and to the nice, white-covered tables there. Also, today was the first time for more than a year that Eddie had not received Holy Communion before he sat down to breakfast. It was so strange to him that at first he could scarcely make up his mind to eat anything, but finally he decided to follow Tim's advice before it should be too late. Strong black coffee and bread and butter made a very frugal meal indeed, but it was better than nothing. Tim gave little thought to anything else save his stomach. He knew from experience that it was best to take what he could get and be thankful. In five minutes' time he was ready to go. "'Are you finished already, Tim?' said Eddie in surprise. "'You didn't eat very much.' "'I'm afraid to.' Dad knows how much bread was here, and I don't want to get him after me. Does he watch things that closely? He sure does. I'll bet he knows how many flies are in the house. 
Well, he's a queer man. That's all I've got to say about him. Tim got up from the table. Let's get out now, Eddie, he urged. It's growing late and I'll have to get two bags of coal before noon. There's no use waiting for the others to get up. I've fixed their breakfast, now I can do my own work, and when that is finished, I can take it easy. Will you go along with me? I think Dad expects you to go with me every day, though he didn't say so. Yes, Tim, I'll go along with you, but I'm not going to steal any coal. Eddie's voice was firm. I'll go just to get away from here. I'd rather be in jail, I think, than live in this awful place where no one says any prayers or goes to church. God will punish these fellows. You see if he doesn't. I bet he will, Eddie, but you see, there's nothing else for us to do. I wish you weren't so scary about running away, Tim, Ed reasoned with him. I think it's worth taking a chance. I just hate to go alone. With you along, things will be different. You ain't talking me into it, Eddie. Nope. Tim was very emphatic. I'd rather have my skin altogether than take such a chance. You wait until you get a taste of Dad's arm once, then you'll talk different. Without further ceremony, the boys were off to the yards. Tim went about gathering his coal, but Eddie was more interested in a large locomotive which was puffing nearby. It was the first time that he had ever been so close to one of these iron monsters, and his boyish curiosity was aroused. Forgetting his orders, he walked up to the engineer, who was sitting on the steps of his engine. "'Hello, mister,' he began. Then noting the engineer's very dejected look, he forgot his own troubles for the moment and said, you look sad this morning. There was something in the lad's look that the man could not resist. Here was someone who wanted to sympathize with him. So you think I look sad, do you? I sure do. Well, my boy, I am sad. I was thinking of my dear wife who died last week. She was the best pal I ever had, and I can't get my mind off her. You never fully appreciate people until they are gone. And haven't you any mother, either? asked Eddie. The man did not smile at the boyish question. No, he replied. My mother died a long time ago, my boy. She has been dead more than five years. What's your name? My name is Eddie. Where does your mother live? I have no mother now, but I guess I did have one once, said Eddie. I can't remember very well. I've been living with the sisters at Mount St. Joseph for a long time. The other day an old fellow came and got me. And now I live with him and with that boy over there and some others. I like Tim all right, but I don't care for the rest. None of them say their prayers are good at church, and they do things that are wrong. I'd like to get away. What is the man's name? Eddie was on the verge of telling when Tim's warning came back to his mind. I can't tell or I'll get a beating. Oh, there is Bill coming. It was one of the older boys that Eddie had cited. And he saw me talking to you. Mister, can you help me? I'll get my throat cut if I go back. Dad said he'd do it if we talked to anyone. I'm sure Bill will tell on me. What can I do? I wish you would come with me and keep that old man from hurting me. The engineer was now fully aroused. Say, my boy, who is this Dad? Is he your father or any relation of yours? No, he isn't any relation to me at all, Eddie answered eagerly. I never saw him until the day he came after me to Mount St. Joseph. He makes me go stealing coal with little Tim or at least Tim thinks that's what he wants me to do, and I'm not used to people who do wrong. When I was with Mother Rose, all I had to do was to sing. Well, I'd like to know who this fellow is you have been talking about, said the man grimly. I believe I could handle him. Please, mister, I can't tell you. I'm afraid. His new friend tactfully changed the subject. So you are a singer, then? Yes, I used to sing in the chapel and at entertainments. I like to sing, especially when Sister plays, for me. Eddie's face brightened as happy memories came back. Say, can you sing Home Sweet Home? Yes, I sang that for Father Smith once, and he liked it a lot, Eddie replied. It is an old favorite, Sister used to say. Will you sing it for me? By this time, Eddie had a tremendous liking for his new acquaintance. Without a moment's delay, he sang the requested song, and in such a way as to make a tear come to the engineer's eye. As soon as Eddie noticed this, he stopped, and running up to the man, put his childish arms about his neck, saying gently, Please don't cry, mister. I don't like to see people cry. It makes me so sad. Well, I wasn't exactly crying. Eddie felt strong arms about him. 
he was hugged tightly to the man's breast. For the first time in the boy's life, he realized what it meant to be without a father. He had not known that men possessed such tender feelings as his friend had just expressed. That fatherly hug meant much to him. I wish you would come and live with me, Eddie, the engineer now said. Will you? I would see to it that no harm came to you. I'd like to, but I'm afraid Dad would punish Tim if I ran away from him, Eddie explained. You see, he put me in Tim's charge today, but if I can get away alone tomorrow morning, I'll come back here. Will you take me then? I like so much to live with you. The trainman had long hoped that he would be the father of just such a loving child as this. With his wife's death, those hopes seemed blasted, and if he had not been a good Catholic, he might have been tempted to despair. But he had consoled himself with the thought that God was watching over him, and that everything would work out for the best, and now this boy had crossed his path. I sure will, my boy, he replied heartily, and if he hurts you tonight, I'll make it my business to find him and fix him up good. Look at this muscle. I'll try that on him. Can you be here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock? I have to wait here in the siding at that time, and we can have another talk. And you'll sing for me again, won't you? I'll try my best to be here, answered Eddie. Oh, there goes Tim with a heavy load. I must go and help him. And maybe when the old man sees me working, he'll not hurt me at all. Goodbye. Goodbye, Eddie. Don't forget. I won't. This sudden parting of the two new friends left each in a strange mood. Eddie felt that he now had someone to whom he could go for help at any time, while some of the engineer's former cheer and interest in life reasserted itself. He even began to whistle again as he oiled his engine. A fine little fellow, he said to himself, and one doesn't meet many like that. There's something extraordinary about him. A wonderful lad. But it's strange you wouldn't tell me who the fellow is he's living with. There is something queer there. Whoever the man is, he can't be any good, or he wouldn't talk to the child as he does, or send him out to steal coal. I'll make it my business to find out just as soon as I can. By this time Eddie had caught up with Tim, and it was evident by the latter's face that he was not well pleased with what Eddie had done. Bill saw you talking to that man, Eddie, were his first words, and I just bet he'll tell on you. I don't like Bill at all, but of course I dasn't show it, especially when Dad's around. Eddie was already beginning to be afraid. What do you think Dad will do to me? he asked. Tim did not hesitate in his answer. I'm sure he'll give you a hard beating, Eddie. He always does when we don't obey him. I've got more than one. Gee, he hits hard. Better cover your head the best you can, for he always aims for that. Why does he aim for your head, Tim? inquired Eddie fearfully. I guess it's the quickest way to knock you out. He can beat all he wants then, and you can't make any noise. He does the clubbing, but he don't want no noise out of the one he's after. Eddie began to shiver. It was the first time in his life that he had had to dread a punishment. He began to pray that he might not get all that Tim had promised. No sooner had the old man returned that night than Bill, who was his favorite, and who at the same time had begun to take a dislike to Eddie, told him that the boy had been talking to one of the trainmen. Can you imagine that, Dad? Talking to one of them guys right where we have to get the coal. I bet he told him where we live and all about us. I wouldn't put it past the smarty. I did not, sir. I did not. Come here, you whelp, growled Jackson. I'll teach you to obey orders. You know what I told you about talking to people. Please don't hurt me. I'll not do it again. I'll bet you won't do it again when I get done with you. It takes only one lesson to cure such as you, and that lesson I'm going to give you right now. Seizing a stick which lay on a heap of kindling, he proceeded to beat the boy unmercifully. Eddie remembered what Tim told him about covering his head, but he was jerked around with such violence that he could not help himself at all. Oh, Dad, put in Tim, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Please don't. He'll not do it any more. You, you shut up, or I'll give you, you some too. What do you think I give orders for? He was beating the child with such violence that he could scarcely get breath enough to speak. At last a blow struck Eddie upon the head, and the boy fell unconscious to the floor. There the cruel man left him to revive in his own time. There was no mercy in that cold heart, which sin and crime had frozen. Tim would have liked to help his little pal, but he was afraid to do anything at once. Soon there was a chance, however, for Jackson put on his hat and left the house without saying another word. When Eddie came to, he found little Tim beside him, but at first he did not know where he was. 
His blurred eyes wandered about without recognizing anything. I put you to bed, Eddie, Tim told him. Here, drink this water. It's all I have to give you. It's late at night, and I can't get anything for you without waking Dad, and he might hurt you again. Eddie could not understand all that Tim was saying, for his head was in a whirl. He drifted off. Now and then he would come to in pain, but his sheer bodily exhaustion put him to sleep again. When he did awaken fully, it was morning, and Tim told him he had better get up and pretend he was helping with the fire, lest the ire of the old man be roused again. So, aching in every limb, Eddie tried to arise. Oh, Tim, I can't walk, and my head aches so I can hardly see. I'd like to get up, but I can't. I must stay here no matter what happens. If he kills me, I can't help it. Oh, Mary, my dear mother, please help me. Mother Rose told me that you would never forsake me if I prayed to you. Help me now, dearest mother. Oh, Jesus, have mercy on me. These words had a strange effect upon little Tim. He had once said prayers like that also, but now he didn't say them any more. He felt a little ashamed of himself and stood there uneasily. No, I can't get up, Tim, repeated Eddie weakly. Better be sure about it. Is Dad up yet? No, he isn't, was the reply, but I'm afraid to have him find you here when he does get up. He might get after you again. But as Eddie did not stir, Tim made the fire alone. When six o'clock came, he went to call Dad, only to discover that the old man had already left the house. This was not altogether uncommon, and Tim was glad it had happened that morning. He at once hurried to Eddie's bed. You won't have to get up, Eddie told him consolingly. Dad is not home. I'll hurry off to the yards and get the coal, and then come back to you. And if I can get something nice for you to eat, I surely will. You got an awful beating last night. I tried to get Dad to stop, but he wouldn't pay any attention to me. I nearly got some myself. He hates to have anyone interfere with him at any time. I shouldn't have said anything, but I just couldn't help myself. Eddie made another effort. I want to go with you, he said. Help me to get on my feet, Tim. I'm sure I can walk. I'm sure I can. No, Eddie, you stay here and rest for today. I don't think Dad will be back until tonight, and I can get the coal alone. But I must go. I must. You'll find you can't make it, Eddie, Tim answered. There's no need for you to get up at all. I'm sure Dad won't come back early. He never does once he goes out. But Eddie had not been thinking about Dad. He was worrying about the kind man whom he had promised to meet at nine that morning. Would he be able to find him tomorrow? Should he ask Tim to see him today and tell him what had happened? After a moment's reflection, he decided against it. Not even his pal should know anything about this intended flight. It must be kept secret. For while little Tim had been very good to him, Eddie still did not trust him unreservedly. He remembered Mother Rose saying that one who would steal would do almost anything else. It was three days before Eddie was able to leave his bed, although the other boys tried to force him out each morning. Dad did not seem to bother about him. He felt that he had given him the lesson he needed, and that it was of little moment whether that lesson disabled him one day or ten, as long as its purpose was understood. On the fourth day, Eddie was finally recovered enough to go along with Tim, but he could see nothing of his new friend, though he looked over the freight yard with care. So it was with a sad heart that Eddie turned back once more to his miserable abode. A few mornings later he was sent out, not with Tim, but with one of the older boys. What their errand was, Eddie did not know. He was merely ordered to go along. End of Chapter 6 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 7 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 7 A Visit to the Peanut Lady. Eddie made up his mind not to ask Bill any questions about where they were going. It was good just to be away from the house. He felt, besides, that it would be well for him to learn as much about the town as possible, and this expedition might give him a chance. Well, can't you say nothing? Bill finally asked. What's the use? rejoined Eddie, testing his companion. So, you're getting like the rest of us. Getting wise, eh? What do you mean, Bill? Eddie inquired, a little puzzled. 
I mean you're learning to keep your mouth shut. Well, yes. That's a good thing, usually, said Bill. But I want to talk this morning, Ed. Well, go right ahead, then, Eddie encouraged him. I don't mind if you talk. I'd rather you would. You would, eh? Yes. Well, Bill began, the reason why I want to talk this time is that I don't like the job I'm supposed to do. Here, turn down this way. This is the first time I've been sent to rob a woman. Rob a woman? Eddie uttered when he was able to speak. Yes, and an old woman at that, replied Bill. Annie the peanut lady. That's what she's called. Down this way. Where does she live, Bill? Eddie's eyes roved over the bleak neighborhood, and he spoke hopefully. It doesn't look like anyone lives out this way. Well, she does. She lives down here in a shack near the river. I've never been in it, but I know where the place is. Dad thinks she's got lots of money there. He says her kind wouldn't put no money in a bank. She's got it hid somewhere in her shack. Was Dad ever down here to see the place? He says he passed it once, Bill told him. He followed her home one night, just to see where she lived. Dad don't go around places where he'd be seen, you know. He's too smart for that. He don't want to get caught. We've got to find out things for him. Why, there aren't even roads down this way anymore, Eddie pointed out. Only a footpath. Well, you see, she doesn't keep her peanut wagon here, explained Bill. She leaves that downtown somewhere, but we must be near her hut now. There's the river down below. We'll keep on this path until we see the place. Then the thing to do is branch off down through the woods, pretending you didn't even see it, or maybe wasn't interested. That's the first thing you have to learn. See things quick, but show no interest in them. If you show interest, it sort of slows you up, and then if there is folks watching you, they'll suspect you. I learned that early. But are you sure you're on the right track, Bill? Eddie was still hopeful their errand would come to nothing. This is a very lonesome place here. Sure I'm on the right track. Ain't you even seen the place yet? My, you're slow. I saw it a couple of minutes ago, but I just thought I'd wait to find out how long it took you to wake up. Eddie looked around intently, but he could not see the shack perched against the hill near the river bank. It was still too well hidden from his untrained eyes by the trees. We'll make a turn now and go down around the back of it, Bill soon directed. It looked like no one was at home when we passed. Eddie could hardly believe his ears. Do you mean to tell me we went near enough for you to be able to tell whether there was anyone in it or not, and I didn't even know we passed it? Sure, lied Bill, anxious to show off. You'll be sent for glasses very soon if you keep that up. Fine chance I'd have to get glasses from Dad. Well, punk, don't take me too serious, Bill laughed. You've got to develop a line of chatter. What for, Bill? asked the younger boy. Just to keep from paralyzing your jaw muscles, silly. You said it was best not to talk, Eddie reminded him. That's right, if you can't think of nothing but nonsense. Come down this way. We'll pass along by the back of the place and pretend we're interested in the river. Don't look at the shack at all. Then we'll walk up again near enough so as we can see and hear what's going on inside. Get me? Yes, I get you, replied Eddie uncomfortably. Down to the river went the two, but picked up some pebbles and pretended to be trying to throw them across the water. This was his method of showing that he had no interest in the cottage. Then he began on larger stones, throwing them in with a great splash. Eddie, too, threw stones, because he could think of nothing else to do. Well, that's about enough, punk, Bill observed at last. Did you notice how many windows there was in the back of the shack? No, I thought you said not to look. I didn't look either, Bill informed him with a superior air. I saw them out of the corner of my eye when I was picking up the stones. How many are there? asked Eddie, still keeping his gaze turned away from the shack. There ain't none, you goose. Annie ain't a plum fool. She's a smart peanut seller. The two now began to make their way up toward the house, which was indeed a desolate place. It looked much like a small barn, entirely innocent of paint, and gave the impression of having been pushed up against the hill. Surely people don't keep money in a shack like this, Bill, said Eddie and we don't use our line this near a house, either. Shut up! Bill's tone, though low, was vicious. Suddenly the air was charged with growling, snarling sounds, which grew louder and louder as the boys approached. What's that noise, Bill? whispered Eddie in alarm. What do you think? Walk a little farther away from the building. 
just then four large fierce-looking dogs sprang from beneath the house and leapt toward the two boys eddie turned and ran as fast as he could bill tripped but had got up again and was making off when a show boy stopped him can't you see the dogs are chained they ain't aiming to hurt you bill stopped running he didn't want to appear too afraid and he still had a few things to find out about the shack the path is this way again came the voice eddie come here bill called we're going this way he waited till eddie had returned to him then spoke in low quick tones now keep your mouth shut and we'll go and talk to her she's annie the peant lady all right guess she's on her way to work though it's rather late what you boys want around this place annie's voice burst upon them again and now eddie could see as well as hear her better keep wide of it you saw them dogs didn't you i keep them chained during the day and loose at night i'd pity the fellow who came around here after dark they sure scared us miss annie eddie told her they'd do more than scare you if they got near you was the reply and i have others inside i live alone here and i need them for company the ones on the inside i don't let out except when i'm around wait till i get one to show you as peanut annie left the boys and went into the shack they followed her with their eyes then bill turned to eddie only one window and one door to that shack notice both on the front i bet it's hot in summer he had hardly finished when annie reappeared leading a large police dog by a strap she left the door ajar as she came down the walk and the boys could see two other dogs of the same breed standing inside apparently not feeling free to follow this one i take along with me everywhere annie informed them he lies down on the bottom of my peanut wagon while i am at work and i'd like to see anyone come around who had no business to be there don't come too near him now i just wanted you to see him because i think the world of him he's trained to lead the blind i paid a good penny for him but i wanted him didn't i king the dog emitted a fierce growl see he knows when i am talking to you he's my boyfriend ain't you king this time king sprang up and put his front paws almost on her shoulders no i ain't going to kiss you i just wanted to let the boys see how nice you are bill nudged eddie's arm have you any drinking water miss annie i'm terribly thirsty plenty of it she replied hospitably come along and led the way to the door as soon as her back was turned bill whispered to eddie i want to get a look in the dump however the dogs in the doorway prevented him from taking in very much annie was back in a moment with two full cups here's your water boys she said kindly thank you eddie answered politely bill said nothing his eyes still busy with the open doorway well said annie as she took the cups i must be locking up now and going off to work it is a long drag to town and i always walk it we'll wait for you and walk up as far as the road miss annie said bill who was very anxious to see what kind of lock held the door while he covertly watched her annie closed the open window from the inside passed across it a heavy-looking iron grating which by her gestures she apparently locked in place and then came through the door it shut with a pronounced click that made bill know it was a yale lock lastly she drew two padlocks from her pocket slipped them through their irons and locked them folks would think there was millions in that shack laughed annie at the boys but it ain't that i just don't care to have anyone getting into it and meeting and scaring me when i come home at night it must be an awful lonesome place said bill as they walked through the woods up to the road well my boy i see so many people during the day that i'm glad to be away from them at night that's just how it is might seem strange to you but after you've been doing it for nigh on to thirty years you'll know how i feel about it i'm going this way it's much shorter we're heading south miss annie bill told her thanks for keeping the dogs off us take good care of that one you've got with you he's dandy and so peanut annie vanished down the fields nobody'd get anything in that shack ed but i don't know nothing except what i've seen i've got to get back home now to report to dad he's been anxious to hear about it are we going back there now eddie asked his voice saying that he wished they were not right away orders is orders you know we've been long enough at it now for the little we got out of it the two returned along their former route neither saying very much along the way and dad was at home to meet them well did you find out all about the place as much as i could dad bill related their adventure well 
observed Dad. You may need that information soon. I have some plans, but I don't know just when I can get them to work. That's all for today, Bill. Ed, I want you to go along with Al now. He's got a fine job to do, something much more interesting than visiting Peanut Annie. Here's the kid, Al. Get along. On the way, tell him what he needs to know. End of Chapter 7 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 8 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 8 Escape The boys had walked for a long time in a part of the city that was absolutely strange to Eddie. At last he was told to stand on a corner and watch to see whether anyone approached, in which case he was to whistle, and then make a way across the street and down toward the railroad track, there to wait for Al. Meanwhile the latter was going to make what he termed a big haul. "'Walk up and down as if you were waiting for someone,' directed Al. "'Get me, and whistle when anybody comes along. Be sure now, or I'll give you some like you got the other night. Do you hear?' So up and down Eddie walked, while Al strolled with pretended casualness into a building nearby. Suddenly a policeman came along. "'Now what shall I do?' Eddie said to himself. "'Here's a chance to have the old man put in jail where he belongs. If Al gets caught, he'll have to tell the whole thing. I think that's just what I should do.' It was plain to see that Eddie had learned just what a cop could do. How glad he was that little Tim had given him that valuable lesson. He would now show what a good pupil he was. "'Say, mister,' he addressed the policeman, "'there's a boy stealing something in there. Better go in and get him.' The policeman halted in surprise. "'How do you know he's stealing?' "'Because he told me he was going to steal, and I am supposed to be on guard out here.' Without another word, the officer entered the house by the same door the lad had used. For his part, Eddie sped off toward the tracks. After he was far enough away to feel himself safe, he sat down to rest his aching limbs. It was the first time that he had had to use them for hard exertion since he had been mistreated by Jackson, and he found the result very painful. He did not know what part of the city he was in, nor where to go for the night. That was the chief thing that bothered him at the moment. He was through with Dad and the boys. Could it be possible that he would find his friend the engineer again? He looked up and down the tracks, but they were bare of any signs that might lead him back to the kindly man. He did not even know where to begin to search. Eddie was not the only one with a sad heart. Every day when the engineer brought the locomotive into the yard near where he had seen the lad, he looked around for some trace of him, eagerly but in vain. The depression which he had been feeling before he met Eddie weighed upon him more heavily than before. Still he would not give up the search, for he felt sure the boy would come back to him. Night drew on, and the homeless little fellow, though rested from the effort of flight, had no place to go until morning. A few boxcars stood on a siding, and he made his way to one of them as darkness fell. He did not like the idea of sleeping there, but where else could he go? He was afraid to walk around much, for fear that he should encounter one of the boys, or perhaps meet a cop, who would take him off to jail because he was a vagrant. Our poor young friend was indeed learning, and learning fast that it is a very difficult thing to have to shift for oneself. "'If I only knew where Mother Rose lives, I'd go back to her,' sobbed Eddie, half aloud, as he settled down on the bare floor of the boxcar. Soon it was pitch dark. Poor Eddie, alone and afraid, reasoned with himself that the best thing to do would be to get his prayers said, and then try to sleep before he got too scared to do so. He turned his mind away from Al and what his own words to the policeman had done. Al knew there was no one home in the place he intended to rob. Not hearing a warning whistle from Eddie, which would have indicated trouble outside, he thought he was safe. He was just making his way toward the door with his prize, a number of valuable jewels, when he heard footsteps. He tried to hide behind some portieres, but the policeman caught him. Without any ceremony, he was hurried to the jail and his coveted hall taken from him. Nor was this all. By sheer force, the officers at the police station drew from the lad the name and occupation of the man with whom he lived, what would be the best time to find Dad in, and all the particulars concerning the boys who worked with him. 
Be sure to tell us the truth, lad, or it will be you that will pay for it, the policeman in charge warned him. You'll get nothing to eat but bread and water if you refuse to tell us anything we want to know. What will be the best time to find this Jackson at home? He generally gets home in time for his supper. What time do you have supper? Any time after six. And does he go out at nights, too? Not very often. Do you like to live with him? I do now, but I didn't at first, answered Al. It isn't so bad when you get used to it. There's a kick in it that I like. The officer frowned. How many others live with you? There are four now. Did you have a young kid to stand outside while you were in getting your haul? was the next question. Al nodded, and the officer continued. Is he one of the gang? Yes, but he's new at the game, the squealer. I'd like to get hold of him. What would you do? I'd smash his face for him, replied Al angrily. I'd give him more than he got the other night. What do you mean, the other night? He got a beating from Dad for talking to a stranger. We don't talk to strangers. How long has he been with you? The policeman wanted to know. Oh, not very long, the sissy. Do you think the sissy has gone back home now? No, I don't, was the answer with a sneering laugh. I don't think he'll ever show up there again. He hates the place. He's not used to it, or he'd like it. So you really think you like that stuff now? Yes. The officers had heard this same story too often before. Someone doing wrong for the sake of the kick in it. Well, they too hoped to get a kick out of their night's job, for they intended to visit Jackson at about eight o'clock that very evening. You are to come along with us, they told Al. We must have a guide. Oh, I don't want to go along with you, he exclaimed, terrified. Dad will kill me if he sees me. Don't you worry about getting killed, boy. We'll see to it that there's no killing. That is, unless it's necessary. I have this, you know. And the policeman put his hand on his revolver. Then what are you going to do with me? inquired Al solemnly. We'll see that you are properly taken care of, said the police captain. It may be necessary to put you in a reformatory somewhere. I can't say for sure. Anyhow, you'll be given a new start in life. You're too young to be a criminal. It's not all your fault, and we won't be harsh with you. At 7.30, two policemen and the boy made their way to Jackson's house. That it was in the most run-down and dingy part of town, they knew by the name of the street. Here's the place, Al said, pointing to the house that for a long time had been his only home. You're sure now. We don't want to be getting into any but the right one. I'm sure all right, replied the boy. No use going into a place where you don't live, is there? No, that's just what I've been saying. The police been paused to take counsel with each other. They were interrupted suddenly by the approach of another officer of the law. You're just in time, Jerry, they greeted him. We're about to make a clean-up here, and we'll need you. A clean-up, you say? That sounds mighty interesting to me. There's been nothing happening for many a day in these parts. The leader then repeated to the newcomer what Al had told them, that if the old man was at home and one of the lads answered the door, it would mean trouble for the intruder. It was Jackson's custom to take his stand behind an old curtain, gun in hand, ready for anyone who should venture to enter unbidden. If Dad himself came to the door, it would be easy going for the policeman, for they could make him throw up his hands at sight. And do you think the old man's there? We have no way of knowing for sure, Jerry. You stay here, Bill, with the boy. Jerry and I will go to the door. Just call if you need any help, and I'll be there, said the one called Bill. There isn't much fun just watching, you know. Lightly the leader walked up the steps and was just about to cross the porch when the door flew open. Dad had heard the sound, and nervous from awaiting the boy's return, had come out himself to meet them, as he thought. He was not meeting just what he had expected, however, and a strange quiver ran through him. His practiced instinct told him that the officer of the law who faced him was intent upon nothing else but taking him into custody. "'Hands up, Jackson,' came the peremptory order or I'll dust your brains for you. We we're mighty glad we called just when we did. We might have missed you, and that would have been too bad. Jackson feigned complete surprise. What do you want me for? That you'll find out a little later. Don't worry. We have no time for explanations now. At that moment, Al made an attempt to call out a warning, but the officer who had him in charge 
planted his hand over the boy's mouth, and nothing more was heard from him. Get that kid, the leader of the squad directed Jerry, as Tim, the little pal of Eddie, made his appearance. You can't tell what these kids will do. Tell them to get this fellow's hat and coat, and we'll hike the whole bunch to the cooler. We've been looking for you for quite a while, Jackson, and I'm glad we got you. We have one of your crew out there on the walk. Come here, Bill. In a moment, the three officers were together, and Al was confronted by Dad's angry look. I'll get even with you, you cur, was the only word the frightened lad received from his guardian, but he had not expected anything more. Choke that stuff, Jackson, or I'll test the shooting iron on your dome, a policeman advised him. We don't monkey with the likes of you. Put on this coat and hat. Come along, lad. Are we going to search the place? Jerry wanted to know. Not right away, the leader replied. We'd better get this gang off our hands first. We can lock the place up and then come back later on. There are two more in there, put in Tim, who suddenly began to understand the situation. For a moment there was dead silence. The police eyed their commanding officer. You say there are two more boys in there? Yes, responded Tim unhesitatingly. Bill and Chuck. Quite a family. Bring them out here, Jerry. I can take care of these. And be careful. Don't trust anyone, kid or no kid. Jerry cautiously made his way in, and before long returned with his prisoners. That was easy, he told his superior. They were in bed. I suppose you hated to wake them, joked the commanding officer, then turning to them. Well, boys, you can finish your sleep when we get to the jail. There are bunks enough there. Say, Jerry, this is the best cleanup we've made in a long time. Seems to me we'll straighten up a lot of things now. I'd never have thought there were so many of them all in the same racket. Well, let's get going now. Put the irons on them. That's it. Now into the car, boys. We're going for a ride. Where is Eddie, Al? asked little Tim. He went out with you, didn't he? Don't talk to me about him, was the savage reply. I'll blacken his eye for him if I ever see him again. It's his fault that I got caught. But little Tim would not be quiet. He repeated in sorrowful tones, I want Eddie, Al. End of chapter 8 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 9 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 9 in a strange land. In the dark, bare box car, little Eddie slept on, unconscious at last of all earthly strife. Now and then he felt a jolt which half awakened him, but he was too spent to rouse himself enough to notice that he was fast leaving behind him not only Dad, who had been so cruel to him, but also the good man who planned to take him away from the den of thieves forever. In the course of the night, the car in which he lay had been coupled to a train bound for another station. What would Eddie say when he awoke and found himself speeding off to unknown realms? He had been in strange enough surroundings before, but now the very possibility of meeting any of his acquaintances again was seemingly being taken away from him. Yet God had not forgotten Eddie, neither had the boy forgotten God. Morning dawned, and through the partly open door a few early sunbeams played upon the bare floor. At last the little sleeper awoke. A moment was enough to give him a sense of his plight. Where was he? Springing to his feet, he made for the door, and the first thought that came to him was to jump from the train. But when he observed with what rapidity it was moving, he sank down again upon the floor to wait until it stopped, or at least slowed down. What a long wait it was! Poor Eddie was very hungry. He had had nothing to eat for dinner the day before, nothing for supper, and now breakfast time had come. At last, hours later, the train began to slacken its speed. Within a very few minutes it had come to a standstill. He looked about him from the door for an instant, and then jumped to the ground. Poor, hungry, homeless Eddie! But yet, in his very troubles, he was like our blessed Savior, who had no place to lay his head. A short distance away was a church, bearing a cross, and to this the lad turned. He felt sure it was a Catholic church, and that the occupant of the little house next to it was a priest, who would take him in and give him something to eat, and perhaps money enough to return to Logan and his friend, the engineer. 
He had often heard that a priest will not turn away any one who asks for help in the name of the Lord, and especially when the beggar has no means of earning his own living. And surely Eddie belonged to that class. Pausing a moment at the gate, he surveyed the surroundings, wondering at the last moment whether to bother the priest or not. It was the sense of total emptiness in his stomach which impelled the lad along, so flinging open the gate, he walked up toward the porch between two evenly trimmed rows of barberry. He pushed the bell and waited. Soon the door opened, and a rather stern-looking woman appeared. "'And what do you want, pray tell?' "'Please, lady, I would like to see the priest.' "'You'd like to see the priest, would you? What do you want with him?' "'Well, you see—' "'No, I don't see. It seems that everyone in the town is wanting to see the priest. It's no wonder that he is a wreck of nerves.' "'But I didn't.' "'No, you didn't know, but I'm telling you. "'You are about the sixth one who's been here this morning. "'Don't you think Father has anything else to do?' "'Nothing but to take care of those who want me,' came a voice from inside, "'and before Eddie knew what had happened, "'he was in the presence of Father Ryan, "'while the woman seemed to vanish into the background. "'Well, my boy,' the priest went on genially, "'what can I do for you?' "'Well, I, uh, Father, I'm awfully hungry.' I haven't any home, any father or mother, and I haven't had anything to eat for a long time. Will you please? Come in, come in, my boy. Surely you must have something to eat. Come right into the dining room and I'll give you a good dinner. My good cook there is trying her best to protect me. She thinks I'm worked to death. I do have a lot of things to do, but a man is supposed to, isn't he? Well, not too much, father, and I'm sure I wouldn't want to add anything to your work. Now, forget about that. What is your name? I don't believe you told me. My name is Eddie, Father. Eddie, that's a fine name. And do you know it's what I used to be called years ago, lad? How the time flies, and what wonderful memories that Eddie recalls. What is your last name? I don't know, Father, replied the boy. I don't believe I ever heard it mentioned by anyone. I have never been called anything but Eddie since I can remember. Sister never called me anything else, and it never occurred to me to ask her. Perhaps even she never knew. Father Ryan thought it was not the time for more questions just then. First, he must get the child something to eat. That was more important than finding out his history. He could get that at any time. The little lad was not going to rush off for a while, at least. I'll go see the cook. Katie, Katie, where are you? I'm out here, your reverence came the voice that had spoken so severely to Eddie a short time before, but I'll be there in a minute. Don't bother, returned Father Ryan. I'll come out there. I have a little boy here who is badly in need of something to eat. Would it be too much trouble for you to fix something for him? Not at all, Father. Sure, and I took a fancy to the boy as soon as I laid eyes on him. It was a hard thing for me to talk rough to him like I did, but was thinking of you, Father. You have so many things to do. They'll be the death of you. Come, come, Katie, expostulated the priest kindly. Don't be worrying about me. You might get Miss Shearer to help you. She's cleaning upstairs at present. No, I won't need any help, Father. I have plenty of things ready. You leave them to me. Within a few minutes, Eddie was doing justice to the dishes the good cook brought in to him. You don't think me a crabby old woman, do you, my boy? Of course he doesn't, Katie, quickly put in Father Ryan. Now eat all you want, Eddie. Don't be afraid. After you have finished, we'll have a long talk. When you are through, you can call me, my boy. I'm going back to work. Leaving the new arrival to himself so he could eat to his heart's content without the embarrassment of being watched, Father Ryan proceeded to his little study to complete the plans for a parish bazaar to be held during the coming week. His parish was a poor one, and he must take special measures for raising the money to keep it up and to support the school. Little did he dream that the unkempt lad in the dining room was going to be of great service to him within the next few days. Eddie would be worth far more than what his few meals would cost, but the good father did not know this. Father, a boy's clear voice sang out, where are you? Eddie had finished his dinner and was awaiting his chance to talk to the priest and try to get from him a second kindness, the money necessary to get back to the friend who intended to be a father to him. Come in here, my lad said the priest hospitably. I'm working on some plans for a bazaar, a fair. Did you ever go to a fair? I don't know what that is, father, 
but I haven't been anywhere for a long time, except once on a boat. Eddie's tone became dreamy as he tried to recall an almost vanished picture from his past. And then I lived with George's, the man who took me on the boat. After that I was at Mount St. Joseph for a while, and last I was with a bad man they called Dad. Well, you've been moved around a lot, my boy. You say you were on a boat. Where was that? I don't know where, for I was very little then, Eddie replied. I just know that I got awfully sick while I was on it. Otherwise, I don't believe I would remember it at all. The man I came with said we were going to a new world, but I don't know if this is it or not. You see, I was only about four years old then. I don't remember the name of the town where I lived before then, but it seems to me I had a nice home and a mama, too. She could play the piano and sing just fine. She said she was going to teach me as soon as I could learn, for it would come easy to me. I... I wish... I could find my mama. Do you know how I could find her, father? It seems to me that would be a very difficult thing to do, Eddie, since you do not remember where you lived, answered Father Ryan thoughtfully. If we only knew that, it would give us the point of departure, at least. But we may find her yet. At present I am very busy, but I shall do all that I can for you, Eddie. Father Ryan was becoming deeply interested in his young visitor. Eddie was not an ordinary lad, that he realized at once, and it was important that he be properly taken care of. The priest also reflected that one of his parishioners was a secret service man, and that it might be well to have a talk with him about Eddie's case. "'Where is this Mount St. Joseph you said you lived at?' he asked. "'That is the name of an orphan home, isn't it? It seems to me I have heard of it.' "'Oh, that is where Mother Rose lives, and where my little friend Benny is staying.' Father, you don't know how much I liked it there, but they are poor and can't keep the boys as long as they'd like to. Mother Rose and the sisters treated me so well. I used to have a fine little white bed, and I could go to Mass and Holy Communion every morning. I haven't been to either since I left there over two weeks ago. Dad wouldn't let any of the boys who stay with him go to Mass, and I know some of them are Catholics. Dad said it wasn't good for their business to go to church. He must have been a very bad man indeed. What kind of work did he do? He didn't work at all. He and his boys stole everything they could get their hands on. I told the cop on one of them, and he's in jail, and maybe he had to tell about the rest of them. I hope they are all in jail, except little Tim. He was very good to me. Do you really want them to be in jail? asked the priest gravely. Well, some place where they couldn't do harm and could learn to do what is right. Well, my boy, there are better places than jail for that, Father Ryan told him. Then get them sent there, Father, Eddie begged. I never knew of any place like that. Seeing that Eddie was becoming upset by his questions, Father Ryan turned somewhat reluctantly from the subject and, rising from his chair, looked out upon the lawn. Many strange thoughts ran through his mind concerning the child. What should he do with him? Surely Eddie should not be left to drift from place to place, among all sorts of people, with no one to care for him. He was a Catholic child, and the sacred fire of faith which God had given him must not be allowed to go out. Yet Eddie had told him that he had not been to Mass for more than two weeks. He was still so young, it would not take long for him to get out of the habit of going altogether, if he had not someone to encourage him. Father Ryan never forgot he had been appointed by Almighty God as a pastor of souls. Now, though this lad did not belong to his parish, he still felt keenly an obligation to do whatever he could for him. He addressed Eddie once more. So you can sing, can you? Will you sing for me? I'd like to, but Father... Eddie spoke the anxiety that was uppermost in his thoughts. I want to go to my friend who is going to take me as his pal. He was so good to me before I got an awful beating from Dad, but I've not been able to find him since. I don't know where he lives, for I never traveled much on trains before, and I came here in the dark. Beating, said Father Ryan, startled. Who beat you, child? Dad did, and I was sick for two or three days. You see, I talked with the man in the train yards, and this was against Dad's orders. He didn't want any of us to talk to strangers, for he was afraid of being found out. We might tell his name and what he was doing. 
but I forgot what he told me and talked to a nice man who was sitting on the steps of his engine. He promised to take me with him if I would come back to him the next morning at nine o'clock. But I got such an awful beating that night I couldn't get up the next morning. Realizing from Eddie's look that these memories were almost too much for the child to bear, the good priest went to the organ in the corner and, drawing him to his side, began to play a familiar tune. "'Oh, I sang that many a time, Father,' Eddie exclaimed. "'Isn't it called Home Sweet Home? Sister Adelaide used to play that in such a lovely way. She certainly could play, both the piano and the organ.' "'Yes, my boy, that is Home Sweet Home. It was my mother's favorite.' and is one of the few songs that I remember how to play. You see, I don't have very much time for music now. I'm kept pretty busy trying to devise means of paying the debt that is on the church. We are very poor people here. Would you mind singing Home Sweet Home for me, Eddie? It would give me much pleasure. I'll try, Father. Once more the good priest played the sweet old air, and the lad's clear voice filled the house with its echoes. The words themselves meant but little to the homeless wanderer. What did he know about the pleasures of a home? It is true he had some very faint recollections of once living in a home with his mother, but they were too vague to cause any sympathetic reaction. Many a time during the two stanzas, Father Ryan would have loved to stop playing and just listen, or even better, draw his little friend to his breast with a fatherly hug. He had never heard a child sing so sweetly, it was evident that some patient teacher had put in many an hour with him. That was great, Eddie, was his enthusiastic comment. My, but you can sing. Who taught you, child? Sister Teresa taught me how to sing, Father, and Sister Adelaide taught me how to play. They both live at Mount St. Joseph, and I wish I had never had to leave them. If you knew them, Father, you wouldn't blame me. I think all the sisters are just wonderful. The boys at the home cry when they have to leave. I cried too, but it didn't do any good. Mother Rose said she'd be glad to keep me, but they are so poor. I'm going to help her when I get big. That's very fine of you, Eddie, responded Father Ryan, but you'll stay a few days with me, won't you? Why, Father? Eddie wanted to know. I'd like to have you sing at the bazaar, and that way you can help me to get some money to pay off the debt I have on my church and then I'll be able to pay your way to this friend, this man for whom you have such a great liking. That is, of course, you can go to him if I find he is as good as you think he is. So will you stay with me now, Sonny? Yes, Father, I'll stay if you promise to help me find him. You'll think he's great. He liked me very much and was so big and strong that I am sure Dad will not dare to hurt me if I am with him. He is a fine man, and I pray every day for him. I know that my prayer will be heard, and that I'll find him. He has no mother either, and his poor wife died about a week before I met him. Yes, my boy, I'll do all I can for you, you may be sure of that, the priest assured him. I'll take you to our organist today, and she will teach you some new songs. My people will be delighted to hear you, and we may be able to find out from some of them where your friend lives. I have many railroaders in my parish, and you can meet some of them. You know, in small towns, people know one another better than they do in large cities. Trust me, my boy. I'll do my best for you. End of chapter 9 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 10 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 10 The Surprise To no one did Father Ryan speak a word concerning the boy. He contented himself with telling his people that the bazaar would open on Tuesday afternoon and that there was a big surprise awaiting them. Needless to say, there was much guessing as to just what these words meant. What do you think the surprise will be, Mrs. Rafferty? Surprise? What surprise? Haven't you been to Mass this morning? Sure, and don't you see me coming from the door this blessed moment? Mother doesn't hear well, piped up a little voice beside Mrs. Rafferty. Your pardon then, ma'am. I'll be asking Mrs. Smith here. Mrs. Smith? Turning to another friend, what's the surprise father spoke about? 
Faith, and I don't know, Mrs. O'Day. I'm here asking Mrs. Mulqueen, but she's after telling me that she doesn't know a thing about it. She's going over to see the priest's housekeeper. She'll be knowing about it if anyone does. That's the first time Father Ryan has done a thing like this. Yes, it's the first time, to be sure, put in a masculine member of the group in front of the church. But there's a reason for it. And what's the reason, Mr. Fogarty, if I may ask? Sure, and there's no harm in asking, but you may not like the answer when you hear it. Well, I'll tell you later how I like it. So you will, rejoined Mr. Fogarty, slowly, deliberately keeping the woman in suspense. I think it's because he knows the best way to get people interested is to tell but half the case to the women. That's the way to get their curiosity aroused. And sure, a woman needs to have her curiosity satisfied, doesn't she? Faith, and are women the only ones who have curiosity? Flashed Mrs. Rafferty, her Irish spirit fully aroused. You will have to figure that one out for yourself. I'll be seeing you at the surprise party, shot back Fogarty, himself none too calm. And so the priest's secret remained a secret. Father Edward Ryan was an industrious and energetic priest. It was for that reason that he had been sent by his bishop into this little place where others had failed in bringing about desirable results. He had won his way into the hearts of his people, a thing absolutely necessary if lasting good is to be done. He now had them where he wanted them. They were beginning to realize how many duties they had been neglecting. Their old pastor had been too patient with them, and they had taken advantage of him. When Father Ryan had arrived, the entire place was in dire need of repair. He had gone ahead with the necessary arrangements and put the expense up to the parishioners. After all, it was their simple duty to keep up their church. They had responded with good will, and the forthcoming bazaar was evidence of this. On Monday morning, the ladies who were to manage the event were at the church bright and early. Booths of all kinds, paddle wheels, candy stands, fish ponds, everything that could be imagined was there. Late in the afternoon, Father Ryan appeared upon the scene and asked some of the busy workers to set up a little stage-like arrangement at one end of the hall. He explained that he wanted to give a talk at the bazaar and would have to be elevated above the crowd in order to be heard by all. The good priest's wish was carried out promptly as a matter of course, and even the friendly gossipers found nothing strange about his reverence having a platform. "'That's just the thing I want,' said Father Ryan by way of encouragement to the workers, Sure, my good people know how to fix me up when that is necessary. We're only too glad to help you, Father, was the answering chorus. This was very encouraging to Father Ryan, for it was the first time in the history of the parish that anything in the nature of a concerted effort by the parishioners had been undertaken. Tuesday morning the last of the preparations were completed, and early in the afternoon the children of the parish and their mothers, who in the evenings would have to remain at home with the smaller children, in order to give their husbands an opportunity to attend, were crowding in. After giving them a chance to see all the articles which were on exhibition and to purchase whatever they wanted, Father Ryan stepped up onto the platform and announced that a great singer would entertain them for a few minutes. The parish organist, who had been teaching Eddie a few new pieces, meanwhile, and had also rehearsed with him several that he had learned under the sister's care, took up a position at the piano. Then the little waif, a complete stranger to all but Father Ryan, ascended the platform. The crowd instantly fell silent. All their eyes were turned upon the lad. To allow his voice to make its full beginning effect, the accompanist did not play any introduction. Ave Maria, Eddie began, unaccompanied, then softly the piano chimed in with the singer. It was Gunnold's famous musical setting of the Hail Mary. Eddie's clear notes sent a thrill through the audience. At one side stood the priest, eyeing his little friend intently. He thought that the sweet, appealing voice must indeed touch the heart of her in heaven to whom he was singing. Tears stood in many an eye, and some of the audience made no pretense in hiding them. Just like an angel said someone half aloud. When the first song was over, Eddie bowed with simple courtesy to his listeners and began to descend the steps to go to his friend, the priest, but the applause and cries of the audience could not be disregarded. 
Father Ryan desired even more ardently than his parishioners to hear the child sing again, so as soon as he caught Eddie's eye, he gave him a sign to return to the platform. "'That kid can certainly sing!' shouted a lad of fifteen, and that brought another round of applause. Eddie did not feel pride or relation over his success. He was too much taken up with other thoughts for that. These last few days had been filled with strange events, and he wished there might be an end to his anxiety. For his second number, he sang the famous Irish song, Mother McCree, sending the audience into a frenzy of approval. "'Sing it again! Sing it again!' cried voices in the crowd, and soon the cry was taken up by everyone. Eddie looked to Father Ryan for direction. The priest nodded his head, and once more the house waited in silence. When Eddie had finished the song a second time, the applause was even greater than before. Then he proceeded to the other numbers which had been planned for the afternoon, and the crowd listened with unabated enthusiasm. It seemed that they would never tire of hearing this marvelous singer. At last, however, the little program was over. Father Ryan ascended the stage and told the people to return in the evening if they could, and to try to get as many others to come as possible, for the young singer must soon leave them. It would be difficult to describe exactly the influence Eddie had on his listeners. Everyone spoke of him, and many tried their best to find out who he was. But the good pastor was cautious and told no one about the circumstances of the youngster's strange appearance at his door, or the story he had later told the priest. Don't say anything to anyone about Jackson, he instructed the boy. I don't think it well to mention him now. You can trust me, father, Eddie whispered as he made his way through the crowd. Sure, he's some of his reverence's relations, a well-known gossiper said, and this tale spread far and wide. By evening, Eddie's fame was known to everyone in the town, and to the great delight of the priest, the people, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, crowded into the hall. You'll have a bigger audience this evening than you had this afternoon, my boy, he told Eddie. You know, you're being largely responsible for the success of the fair. Think how happy Jesus will be to live in our little church when we get it all fixed up. I have been waiting and praying for that a long time, and now my prayers are answered. And you'll help me to find my friend tomorrow, Father? asked Eddie. You know, he is going to keep me and send me to a real school. I have never had a chance to go to school with a lot of boys. There were only about twenty of us at Mount St. Joseph, and some were very little. I'd like to go to a place where they teach you how to play football. Ever since I first heard of Rockne, I wanted to learn to play that game. And I don't suppose they play football at Mount St. Joseph? No, a few of the boys there knew a little about the game but we never had a real chance to play it. Well, I guess you would have to go to a boys' school for that. Yes, and that's just what I want. Boys should be in boys' school. They'd be better off. You're right, Eddie, returned the priest, but you just leave that to me. If it is at all possible, I'll see that you get to a real school. Soon it was time to go over to the hall again. For the second time that day, Father and Eddie were very warmly received by the people. I suppose he's Father's nephew someone said as the two passed through the crowd and made their way toward the platform. The good priest could hardly restrain a smile at this remark, but even if Eddie had been his nephew, Father Ryan could not have been more fond of him. Absolute silence fell on the assemblage as the pastor mounted the stage. In a few simple words, Father Ryan thanked the people for the help they were rendering him by their attendance at the bazaar, and then announced that his great singer would perform for them. As the little songster ascended the platform, a moment's burst of applause sounded through the hall, then everything was silent. All marveled that one so young should be so unconcerned about appearing before a crowd. This, perhaps, was because singing was almost as natural to Eddie as breathing. Many a time, even in his short life, he had been called upon to sing, and his childish simplicity knew no fear. Now he sang piece after piece for his admiring audience until his rather limited repertoire was nearly exhausted. Then came Home Sweet Home. What a climax! So true and sweet were the tones which rendered the touching old favorite that many in the hall cried openly. As for Father Ryan, he was wishing with all his heart that his dear little friend were safe in a home sweet home. Eddie's recollections concerning his home, dim though they were, had caused uneasy wonder in the mind of the pastor. He knew by the unmistakable candor and sincerity of the lad that there was nothing bad about him. But there was plainly some fraud in his case, though as yet Father Ryan could not get a clue to it. 
he would continue to pray to God for the help necessary to bring about the restoration of the child to his parents, if they were alive and could be found. It might be that they were dead, but for some reason Father Ryan could not make himself believe that. The good priest was not the only one who was petitioning the throne of mercy. Added to his prayer was one equally, if not more fervent, that of the boy's own mother. End of chapter 10 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 11 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 11. Friends Meet. Just as Eddie took his stand beside the priest again, after having entertained his appreciative audience, a man made his way through the crowd and stopped by Father Ryan. Father, do you know this boy? he demanded. Before the priest had time to answer, Eddie shouted, Oh, Father, it's my friend! It's Jack the Engineer I have been telling you about. Oh, Jack, how happy I am. I never dreamed of meeting you way out here. But my boy, how did you get out here? That is the question. I have been looking for you every day and had just about decided to give up the search. I thought I would find out more about you when the Dad Jackson case appeared in the papers, but I was disappointed. You must tell me all about it and how you got out here. Thank God I found you. Father... He turned to the priest again. I'd like to have a talk with you. Very well, Jack. We'll go over to the house now. Come, Eddie, you must have a good supper. I'm sure you would enjoy something after all that singing. And now that you have found Jack, he will be our guest. Oh, I don't want anything to eat, replied Eddie. I'm not in the least bit hungry, but I'm awfully happy now that I have found Jack. Father, you can keep all the money you earned at the fair. Jack will take me home, won't you, Jack? Indeed I will, my boy, but first I have a good many things to tell father and you, and when these are straightened up, we'll be happy. It is certainly marvelous how quickly things change. I'll get a pitcher of cold water, said the priest as they entered the house. That's the only kind of drink I ever keep in the house. Make yourselves at home. I'll be with you in a minute. When they were left alone, Jack turned his attention to his little friend. Eddie, that was wonderful singing this evening, he said proudly. I never thought when I came here for the bazaar that I should find you here. But God has heard my prayers. I've been praying for you ever since I first met you, and I'm sure you have been doing the same. I always pray to the little flower when I want anything. You know she promised to spend her eternity doing good upon earth. I always remind her of that. Surely she has let fall one of her roses this time. Oh, so you know about the little flower too, exclaimed Eddie happily. We always prayed to her at the mount. Sister Teresa there is a special friend of little Teresa. She taught us to have a great devotion to her. Many a favor we have received because of it. I pray to her every day. And so do I, put in Father Ryan, re-entering the room. I put the entire bazaar under her special protection, and I can see now why it was that everything worked out so well. It is strange what a wonderful hold the dear little flower has taken on all hearts. I am so happy that she has been canonized. I notice that there is no statue of her in your church here, Father, observed Eddie. Not yet, my boy, returned the priest. The problem of buying things has been difficult, but I'm planning to get one. I will get it for you, interposed Jack. Or better still, Father, you order the one you want and give me the bill. We will erect it to her in gratitude for having taken care of our little friend here. What do you think of that, Eddie? Oh, that will be great. I hope we are here when it comes. I'd just love to see one in the church like the one we had at the mount. Well, that's easy, Jack said. We'll make a visit over there and find out where the sisters got it, and we'll get one just like it, if that will suit Father. Oh, I'm sure I'll like it, replied Father Ryan, smiling at the two friends, the man and the boy. After that point was settled, Jack related to Father Ryan how the boy had come up to him in the freight yard, where he was waiting for orders to go to Norwood, and then returned to this town. Eddie, listening attentively, learned to his surprise that Jack was one of Father Ryan's parishioners. Then Jack went on to tell them the story of Jackson and the boys as it had appeared in the newspapers. It was found out that the old man was even worse than had been suspected. He was proved to have murdered a wealthy man, 
from whose home he and his boys had then carried off valuables amounting to several thousands of dollars. These and many other stolen items were found secreted in the gaunt rooms where Eddie had spent such a time of misery. Did the papers say how they were found out? asked Eddie. It merely stated that one of the boys was arrested in the act of stealing some jewels, and that the officers of the law forced him to tell the whole story. I'm glad that my name wasn't brought into it. You know, it was I who told the policeman on Al when he was in that house. You did? exclaimed Jack in wonder. Yes, I was sent along with him to keep watch while he went inside, and I didn't want to help in a robbery, so I told the cop who came along just after Al had gone in. I'm glad they got caught, for they had planned to rob poor old Peanut Annie. Peanut Annie? Who's that? She's an old woman who has a peanut stand back there, explained Eddie. Dad thought she had a lot of money stored away in her shack. I met Annie the day I was sent along with one of the boys to inspect the place. Well, she wasn't mentioned in the papers, so I guess they didn't molest her, said Jack. And where are Dad and the boys now, continued Eddie. Where is little Tim? Dad will get a life sentence, at least, Jack answered, and the boys, with the exception of Tim, were sent to a reform school. Tim, on account of his youth, was put in his sister's home. And that reminds me, Jack again addressed the priest, do you think I ought to write to Mount St. Joseph about our little friend here? Or would it be all right for me just to take care of him and say nothing about it? I really want Eddie for my son, father, and will do whatever you think best to get him. I'll write for you and get the matter straightened out, said Father Ryan. I owe an awful lot to Eddie because of the success of our fair, and it would give me much pleasure to do that for him and for you. I'll look up the exact address of the Mother Superior. Leave it to me. When do you go for your next run? I have taken a week off, Jack replied, as I am not feeling very well. I've been intending to go to my sister's home in Bryan for a rest, and now that I've found Eddie, there's no reason for putting it off any longer. You know, Father, Margaret has gained quite a reputation as a pianist. She is just back from a concert tour and is resting up. Her vacation will be the more pleasant because of Eddie, for I know she will like him very much. She just loves children. It has been a long time since I have seen Margaret, Jack, mused Father Ryan. In fact, I don't think I've met her since she went to Paris on that scholarship to complete her studies. I am very glad indeed that she has succeeded so well. I wish I had thought about her before this. I would surely have asked her to help me with my fare. I am sure she would have been more than willing, Jack responded. What a great thing it would have been if she had played for Eddie tonight. I know she would do everything in her power to help him develop his voice. She might even take him along with her on tour sometime, if it doesn't interfere with his schooling. She has always told me that it is a lonesome life for her, especially as so much time must be spent on trains. That's a splendid idea, was the priest's reply. I am so happy to think that Eddie is to be taken care of. He has a marvelous voice, and if he is properly trained... We need not worry about his future. I'll do my best to get things arranged for you. Will you be able to call here Saturday afternoon? I'll have a letter from the sister by that time. I'll be here, Father. Father Ryan now had to get back to the bazaar, so Jack and Eddie bade him good night and left for Jack's home. The man could not but marvel at the complete confidence that the child placed in him. Had the engineer been his own father, Eddie could scarcely have shown him a more affectionate trust. This was partly because the boy was at the age when boys almost adore a strong, able man. It was almost because Eddie's instinct told him that Jack was a person of solid worth. It will be very quiet here, said the man, as the two entered the neat little house, for since my wife died, things have changed very much. Then, too, I'm not at home but two days a week. Tomorrow we'll go to Brian to see Margaret. I am sure you will love her. Though she is my own sister, she is next to my dear wife, the nicest woman I've ever met. Oh, I'm sure I'll love her, Jack, if she's anything like you. She's much nicer than I am, Eddie, laughed Jack, much nicer. She's been more like a mother to me than a sister, even though we're nearly of the same age. Jack paused, his thoughts reviewing the happenings of the evening. When he spoke again, there was satisfaction in his tone. It's fine to think we have good Father Ryan on our side, I am sure everything will work out satisfactorily. My, agreed Eddie, father is certainly a wonderful man. He was so good to me. You should have seen the big dinner he gave me the first day I went there. 
It was the best I ever had in my life. I'm sure it was, Eddie. Do you know, I am truly proud of you. It makes my blood boil to think of old Jackson's hurting you. Now that the court has him in hand, he'll get all that he deserves. How long he has been engaged in that robber business is not known. It was a splendid thing that you were courageous enough to tell the policeman about Al. That's what really stopped Jackson. Just think what would have become of those poor boys he was training up into that fearful life. Now they have a chance to become good citizens. I hope that Tim will be well taken care of, put in Eddie, and I know that he'll be safe and happy if they put him with sisters. Poor little Tim was a Catholic, Jack, but he never went to church any more and never said his prayers. He told me he used to be good before he fell into Dad's clutches. Yes, that is the regrettable part about the whole affair, answered Jack thoughtfully. It is awful to think that a man like that could get hold of young boys as he did. He certainly must have assumed a wonderful disposition when he went to Mount St. Joseph's for you. I didn't like his looks at all, Eddie informed him. Of course, I can't blame poor Mother Rose for letting me go with him. She thought he was all right. We'll go back to see her some day and tell her all about what happened. And, concluded Eddie, his mind reverting to the gang, I'm sure glad they didn't have a chance to rob poor old Peanut Annie. For some reason or other, I took a great liking to that old woman. End of chapter 11. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 12 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 12 Wanted by the Police. Eddie was up at what he thought an early hour the next morning. Once he had awakened, the thought of the trip with Jack made it impossible for him to stay in bed, and Jack was almost as excited. He was finishing his packing when Eddie came into the living room. My, you're up early, was Jack's greeting. How about you? Eddie taunted. Well, I'm a railroader, the man reminded him. So you have to be on the go, is that it? You're right, and that reminds me, we'll have to be on the go for something to eat. I'm hungry, and I know you are. We'll have to go out to a restaurant for our breakfast. We've got plenty of time. How about a good dish of flapjacks? Flapjacks? Eddie was enthusiastic. Gee, I haven't had anything like that for a long time. Well, are you ready? Sure I am. Then we're off. When the two got out onto the street, Eddie realized that it was later than he had supposed. Already people were on their way to work, and he noticed, too, that some of the stores were open for business. "'Here's a good-looking place, Eddie,' said Jack, stopping in front of a prosperous-looking restaurant. "'What do you say?' "'Looks well to me.' They went in. A waitress came up as soon as they had seated themselves. "'We're looking for a good breakfast of flapjacks,' said Jack, ignoring the menu. Two stacks, shouted the waitress in her breezy style, and as soon as this code word was repeated from the kitchen, she left the two and went over to another man who had just seated himself a few tables from Eddie and Jack. After this newcomer had given his order, he pulled a newspaper from his coat pocket and began to scan it. Meanwhile, the waitress returned to the first table with two plates of pancakes, which she placed before Eddie and Jack. Gee, they smell great, grinned the boy his mouth watering with anticipation. And you'll find they taste even better, replied Jack, his face lighted by a corresponding grin. You've been here before? asked Eddie. Many times, replied his friend, as they began their meal. The conversation attracted the attention of the man with the newspaper. He looked at them casually at first, then stared at Eddie and back at his paper, repeating the action several times. Eddie, on his part, noticed the man, but was too interested in his pancakes to give him much attention. "'Now, what do you think of them?' asked Jack, as he laid down his fork. Eddie sighed with content. "'They sure were fine.' "'Had enough?' "'Oh, yes.' "'Well, suppose we get going, then.' But as they were about to rise from their seats, the man who had been observing Eddie so keenly left his table and approached them. "'Pardon me,' he said, leaning slightly over Jack as if to prevent him from getting up. 
Isn't this the little fellow who sang at Father Ryan's Bazaar? Yes, it is, Jack replied. I thought I recognized him, said the man, laying the open paper on the table before Jack, and then giving his attention to Eddie. You're quite a singer, my boy. I enjoyed your numbers. Have you had a lot of training? No, sir, not very much. Jack's eyes dropped to the paper. He suppressed an exclamation. Looking back at him was Eddie's picture, and above it these words, Boy Wanted by Police. Jack read the article hurriedly, while the stranger talked to Eddie. Then the boy was surprised to hear his friend ask the man, Are you a detective? No, sir. My name is John Gannett. I am a traveling salesman and a special friend of Father Ryan's. I just thought you might be interested in that article. I am, replied Jack. Then turning to Eddie, he said very casually, Well, Eddie, I see you made the papers. What about? asked Eddie, showing no special interest or excitement. Do you recognize the fellow in that picture? asked Jack, putting his finger upon Eddie's likeness. Sure, replied Eddie. That's me. That picture was taken at the mount. Well, Eddie, said Jack slowly, I guess you'd better read what it says under the picture. Eddie's eyes followed the printed words. This boy, who answers to the name of Eddie, is wanted by the police. The boy has no criminal record, but the police have been asked to find him and return him to Mount St. Joseph Orphanage. For some time, Eddie was kept by the notorious Jackson, whose case has attracted wide attention for the past week. Anyone knowing of Eddie's whereabouts is asked to get in touch with the Logan Chief of Police. What do you think of it, Eddie? asked Jack. The boy was bewildered. I don't know what to think, he replied. Would the police hurt me? Of course not, but anyway there's nothing for us to worry about. I'm sure that Father Ryan will have the entire case in his competent hands by now. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Gannett, for calling my attention to this item. Father Ryan has promised to take care of the case for me, and I am going to adopt Eddie legally. Congratulations, my boy, said Gannett, shaking hands with Eddie. I'll be running along now. Well, said Jack when the salesman had gone, I guess we'd better go back home. Others will be seeing you, and until everything is cleared up, it might cause complications. I'll call Father Ryan on the phone and find out what he thinks is the best thing for us to do. But it was not necessary for Jack to call Father Ryan. The priest himself had seen the article in the paper, and knowing that his two friends would be much upset by it, had driven straight over. When Jack saw Father Ryan's car standing in front of their house, his first thought was that it was a police car. He heaved a sigh of relief when Father Ryan stepped out onto the sidewalk. Have you seen the morning paper, Jack? Yes, Father, we have the bad news. Well, don't worry about it, the priest told him reassuringly. My message got to the authorities just after the paper went to press, so it was impossible to stop the story from being printed. Mother Rose knows all about it now. I have called the chief of police and explained the whole thing to him, and he has agreed to let the case drop. Nothing further will appear in the papers. The only thing left for you to do is to sign the papers for the adoption. Well, father, Jack's voice bestowed his gratitude, it certainly was wonderful of you to go to all that trouble. No trouble at all, Jack. It was a pleasure. And how is my little singer today? Just fine, father, Eddie beamed. Won't you come in, father? urged Jack. No, I must be going back. There are always things to attend to in the parish. The helpers are settling their accounts from the bazaar. We certainly have made a fine time during these few days, and made a fine profit, thanks largely to Eddie here. I just had to drop things, though, long enough to let you know that everything is settled. It sure was great of you, father. Come and see me when you get back from Brian, Jack, said the priest, starting his motor. And be sure to bring Eddie along with you. He gave the boy an affectionate smile. My best wishes to Margaret. I know she'll get a kick out of hearing about the whole thing. I'm sure she will. With that, Father Ryan was on his way, leaving his two friends in a much better state of mind. Now that the scare was over, and Eddie was no longer wanted by the police, they would be able to enjoy in peace the week of relaxation which both of them so much needed. End of chapter 12. Recording by Maria Therese.
Chapter Thirteen of Eddie of Jackson's Gang. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Thirteen, A New Life. It did not take our little friend long to get acquainted with his new mother, Margaret Kenny. Jack and Margaret both made it their business to see that he was cared for and happy. Miss Kenny had a fine big car, which she enjoyed driving as a relaxation from her work. She at once became very fond of Eddie, and made it a practice to take the handsome little chap along with her when she went on one of these pleasure spins. He was wonderful company for her, and this was just what she had been wanting. A few days after Eddie's arrival, a letter came from Father Ryan telling Jack where to go to sign the adoption papers, and asking him, if possible, to visit Mother Rose at the orphanage. The same mail, in fact, brought him also a letter from her thanking him for his care of the boy and asking him to come to see her at Mount St. Joseph. Mother Rose had such a big heart that it was able to contain each and every one of her little charges. She made it her business, though the daily care of the boys did not fall to her, to know every individual boy at the Mount, his history, character, and special needs. She was truly a mother. As soon as Jack read the sister's note, he took the necessary steps to make sure that the boy would not be taken from him, unless, indeed, his own mother or father were still living and should happen to find him. Jackson, of course, had established a legal claim on Eddie, but there was no danger on that score now. Jackson's claim was annulled by the court, which granted Jack's adoption request, and Eddie would be known henceforth as Edward Kinney. Margaret devoted more and more of her time to the instruction of the boy. She secured a good vocal teacher for him, supervised his practicing, and taught him many new songs, so that Eddie, in his own way, might be an entertainer equal to herself, whose reputation was already well established. Not many months after Eddie's arrival, Margaret began her second tour, and took her little songster with her. Wherever they went, they attracted large crowds. And why not? It was not a common thing to have a boy soprano on the concert stage. Do you think Mama is among these ladies? Eddie said after his first appearance in a large theater. Margaret had already observed that Eddie never lost the hope of finding his own mother somewhere. It showed that, though only a child, he had the strong nature which does not forget easily. It is hard to say just yet, my dear, but if she is here, she'll surely come to see us as soon as this performance is over. But, she added after a pause, you said you thought you came from over the ocean. It seems so in my memory, but I don't know for sure. And anyway, don't you think she might come over to look for me, if she couldn't find me over there? She may be dead, but I can't believe it. I've always expected to find her some day. Now, please don't worry about it, dear, said Margaret gently. It will only make you unhappy, and I want you to be cheerful and satisfied. If we can ever find her for you, my dear boy, be sure we will. Oh, I know you will, Margaret. I know you will. You and Jack have been very good to me. Eddie thought no more about his mother for the time being. Day after day, the little singer entertained his listeners. Margaret was indeed proud of the boy and wrote to Jack from various places in their schedule, telling him what a wonderful trip they were having. Then one day this letter came to Jack. Dear brother, ever since we left home, Eddie has delighted everyone who came to listen to him. He is a regular drawing card, and such a wonderful companion for me. I have been thinking that he and I should go to Europe together. I have heard quite a few boys sopranos in my time, but none like our Eddie. I am sure he would be a sensation over there. You know, my dear brother, that the boy's voice will be changing after a year or two, and before it does, I think it best that we should take this trip. It ought to be a pleasant one. We shall be amply repaid, not only financially, for I am sure of that, but also in other ways. It will do me a world of good, after this tour is over, to make the restful sea voyage. As for Eddie, it will be to his advantage, if he is to become a professional singer, as we hope. It will also be a wonderfully educational trip. Think this over. I expect to be back in Bryan about the 1st of February. We are enjoying ourselves immensely. Eddie's tutor says that the boy has a brilliant mind, and that he will soon be beyond his years and studies. I am very happy about that. Eddie wishes to be remembered to you. 
Lovingly your sister, Margaret. A good idea, thought Jack as he read the letter. Margaret needs a trip like that. She is the only relative I have in the world now, and as she has taken such a liking to the boy, he'll be great company for her. February 1st found Margaret and Eddie back in their cozy little home. Jack had seen to it that everything was prepared for them. Many of their best friends were gathered there to welcome them, and Eddie was the center of attraction. Oh, Jack, I saw so many people. Eddie was excitedly describing his many adventures to his foster father. They all like to hear Margaret play. She gets lots of flowers, beautiful flowers, even better than the ones we had at Mount St. Joseph. You ought to see them. Now, Eddie, you know the people like to hear your singing as much as they did my playing, smiled Margaret, and when she and her brother were alone, she praised Eddie at greater length. He's a real wonder, she said. I could sit and listen to him for hours. There is something extremely attractive about his voice that I never noticed in any other I have ever heard. Jack was indeed proud of Eddie, but besides that, the boy seemed to fill the void in the engineer's heart. He had hoped and prayed that God would give him a son, but his prayer had not been answered. God had preferred instead to take his young wife away from him before they had the consolation of children. Jack often thought now that his wife must be smiling down from heaven upon her husband and this little boy he had taken as his son, and Jack felt too that Eddie deserved that smile in a special way. He was a thoroughly fine lad with a strong character and a beautiful, unsullied soul. The soul is something that is too often overlooked. Yet it was far more important than Eddie's sweet voice. It was the only thing he would have to account for when it came time for him to die. God would not ask him what sort of voice he had, but he would ask him what sort of soul he had. Jack realized all this clearly. He saw to it that Eddie's naturally fine spiritual impulses were developed. Eddie frequently went with him to confession and Holy Communion, and also often went to weekday Mass and Communion with Margaret. I'll miss you two very much, Jack told Margaret as they discussed her plan. Still, I think it will be well for you to go to Paris, as you wish. You have been wanting to go for a couple of years, I know, and now you have someone for your companion. I'd like to go along myself, but I have to attend to my work. I must save up enough money so that Eddie can continue his education. I want him to go much further than my parents are able to send me. So it came about that within a few weeks' time, Margaret and Eddie were ready to sail for France. But before they left, Eddie begged Margaret to take him to Mount St. Joseph to see Mother Rose, the sisters, and the boys. It was a delightful visit. Eddie was now dressed in a fine suit, one much better than that which Mother Rose had been able to buy for him. But new clothes did not change his nature. He was the old, direct, affectionate Eddie. Do you remember how you hid from me under the porch the day Jackson came for you? said Mother, laughing. You were a little rug then, weren't you? Yes, Mother, but I think I'd do it again if he came again. Yes, I'd do worse than that. I'd get under and never come out. You surely have had some experiences since then. And some of them I wouldn't want to go through again for anything in the world, Eddie replied. I do not doubt that in the least, said Mother Rose seriously. Both of them were silent for a moment. Then Eddie asked, How did little Benny get on after I left? We had quite a time with him for a while, but he finally quieted down. He has been placed in a splendid Catholic home here in the city. He is well and happy. We are sure of him, for this Jackson case put us on our guard, and we do not give up children now unless we have personally investigated those to whom they are going. Letters of recommendation aren't enough, since we have learned that they can be forged. But if you hadn't let Eddie go, mother, we perhaps would never have known him, said Margaret. That's very true, but there must never be another boy of ours go out as Eddie went. One experience like that is more than enough. Does Benny live far from here? asked Eddie. I would like to go and see him. I'm afraid we won't have time enough today, Eddie, Margaret observed regretfully. You will have to wait until we come back the next time. I am to have a long boat ride, Mother, Eddie explained, but it will be great with Margaret. She and Jack have been very good to me. I'll pray for you every day, Mother, and for the other sisters who took such good care of me. Eddie had already seen Sister Teresa, and at this moment his old friend, Sister Adelaide, came up the corridor. 
Mother Rose had sent for her without telling him. Sister Adelaide, he cried happily, and made for the advancing nun. The music teacher warmly greeted her former pupil. Why, Eddie, can this really be you at last? My, I'm glad to see you. Sister, I want you to meet Margaret, said Eddie. She's a great musician, too. A few minutes of happy conversation followed, and then Margaret found it was time to go. I'll pray for you every day, Mother, and for you too, Sister Adelaide. When I come back, I'll be here to see you again. Indeed you must, Mother Rose assented with a look of motherly tenderness. I'm glad you're happy, my boy. Miss Kenny, do you think you'll get to see Lords while you are in France? I must surely see it, replied Margaret. The Blessed Virgin is my special protector. I owe much of my success to her. I am often ashamed at the thought of having spent years in France and yet not having seen the famous shrine. Then, Eddie, Mother Rose turned back to him, I will ask you to bring some of the miraculous water home to me. I can get it here in this country, especially at Notre Dame in Indiana, but it would please me very much to have some that you yourself carried all the way back for me. I have great confidence in Our Lady's protection. I'll surely bring some for you, Mother, promised Eddie. Mother Rose shook their hands in farewell. Miss Kenny, you must call and see me when you return from your trip, and bring Eddie along with you again. I'll always be much interested in the lad, for he was a great source of comfort to me. Thank you, Mother. We will both be back, and do pray for us that we may have a safe journey. End of Chapter 13 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 14 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 14. More Adventures. When Margaret and Eddie got back home from their visit to Mother Rose, they found Jack awaiting them. They wondered a little at it, for they thought he had gone back to work. I've got a surprise for you, was his greeting. A surprise, shouted Eddie in delight. What is it, Jack? Gus. Oh, I could never guess it. Is it for all of us? For Margaret and you? Well, you'll have to tell us, Jack. I'm sure I can't guess. I've had so many surprises, you know. Well, I thought it would cut down the long hours it would take you to go by rail to New York. So I called on a friend of mine who is a pilot, and he has made arrangements for you to fly from Chicago to New York. What do you think about that? To fly? Oh, Margaret, you wouldn't be afraid, would you? Eddie waited in breathless silence for the magic answer. I don't know, Eddie, she answered with some hesitation. I have never gone by plane yet, though I have been tempted to do so more than once. You know how people fear the first attempt at the unusual. I suppose, though, that I could make it. There was not a ring of assurance in the answer, but Eddie was not ready to give up. I think it would be great. Then I could tell Benny all about it when I get back. It will be a long time, continued Eddie, boylike, before he will be able to get a plane ride. Well, it's settled then, decided Margaret, unable to dim the radiance on Eddie's face. We'll go by rail to Chicago, and then by air. That will be great, shouted Eddie, literally jumping up and down for joy. Have you made up your mind when you are to sail? asked Jack. Our boat leaves on the morning of March 15th. Margaret replied. I have wired for reservations. That's fine. I'll take care of the plane for you. You just go right ahead and complete your preparations. The trip from Chicago to New York will be in my hands. Then followed days of preparation and packing. It was a very exciting time, with Eddie as well as Margaret bustling about getting the necessary things together. Frequently, he talked of the journey by plane. That seemed to interest him more than the long trip by boat and his model airplanes and books on aviation became more interesting to him than ever, for Eddie had been enthusiastic about aviation for some time. Finally, the long-expected day came. After a delightful ride from Bryan to Chicago in the company of Margaret and Jack, Eddie found himself snugly seated in a huge transport plane. Margaret sat alongside him, looking out of the window to where Jack waited to wave them a final farewell. At last the signal was given, and the great propellers began to spin and roar. Jack waved his hand as the plane moved onto the runway. 
and very soon the giant airliner, with more than a dozen passengers aboard, became but a tiny speck against the blue sky. There were so many things to interest Eddie as he gazed out of the window. Cities with their thousands of inhabitants looked like checkerboards. Forests sending their spires a hundred or more feet into the air were now vast stretches of flat carpet. Mighty rivers were narrow blue ribbons. Then came the towering mountains, the first Eddie remembered having seen. Wide thoroughfares cut through them, looked like snail tracks through hills of sand. My, we're up high, aren't we? Yes, we have been climbing for quite some time, replied Margaret. I guess we had to get over the mountains. I'm glad that we are going over them in the daylight, Eddie observed. It might not be safe at night. There was a time when it wouldn't have been so safe, but I guess they have much better instruments at the present time, Margaret told him. Are you enjoying the ride, Margaret? You aren't scared, are you? asked Eddie anxiously. No, I'm not scared a bit, she reassured him with a smile. I really am enjoying it much more than I thought I would. Did you notice back there away that we bounced up and down quite a bit? You bet I noticed, Margaret replied with emphasis. I didn't care so much about that. We were going through some air pockets, Eddie informed her. I think that's what my book calls them. Well, whatever they were, I didn't like the idea. I was really a little scared then. I didn't want to say anything to you about it, for I didn't know whether you noticed it or not. That's just the way I felt about it answered Eddie, but I knew right off the bat what caused the bumps. So you feel just like an aviator, don't you, Eddie? Eddie grinned a bit at the gentle jibe. No, I don't feel quite like one yet. Well, keep up your interest in aviation, Eddie. Margaret was serious again. It is the coming thing, you know. Then conversation lagged for a time. The city names along the route meant nothing to Eddie. Some of his first excitement was wearing off, and the trip from now on would have been mainly a repetition of scenes already observed, if it had not been for the passenger sitting across the aisle from Margaret. He had overheard some of their conversations, and finally spoke to her. "'Pardon me, but aren't you Miss Kenny, the noted pianist?' he said by way of introduction. "'I'm Margaret Kenny,' she answered pleasantly, but with no reference to the compliment contained in his question. "'Then the lad there is the boy soprano the music critics have been writing so much about lately.' "'Yes, this is Eddie.' The critics, so far as I know, have been very favorable to him, and we are quite proud of him. He is my brother's adopted son. Eddie, meanwhile, had turned to look at the stranger. I hope you will not think me too curious, Miss Kenny, the latter continued. Oh, not at all, replied Margaret, trying to put the man at his ease. As a well-known musician, she was used to the praise of strangers. The reason I am asking is that I am a movie producer, and I would like to sign the two of you up for a picture. Several of my spotters have already written to me about you and the little fellow. When I heard you call each other by your first names, I began to suspect that you were the ones I had been wanting to meet. Well, replied Margaret, we are on our way to France now. We have been looking forward to this trip for a long time, and our steamship bookings are for March 15th. The man showed his disappointment. I think I could make my offer attractive enough for you to accept, Miss Kenny, he said. People, you know, have made quick decisions which turned out very favorably for them. I couldn't think of changing my mind at present, she answered with a note of finality. Friends of mine in Paris have arranged everything for me. I just couldn't disappoint them. You know how careful one has to be about his public. Being a businessman dependent upon public patronage, I am sure you understand." When the producer saw that he could not shake Margaret's resolution, he tried a compromise. Well, how about the boy? Is he engaged to appear with you in Europe as he did in this country? I was thinking of it, said Margaret. If you would let him stay here under contract, he resumed persuasively, we could go on with that part of the movie without you. Then when you got back, we could shoot the remaining scenes. No, I couldn't leave Eddie alone. I have assumed a great responsibility as it is. I just couldn't think of going on without him. The movie man was visibly disappointed, but he was not giving up. How long do you expect to stay in Europe, Miss Kenny? I don't know absolutely, but I don't think anything less than a month. I have a series of concerts to give, and there may be others that I do not know about at present. You know how things go. Yes, indeed, but here I am asking you to sign a contract, 
and I haven't found out if you would be interested in entering the movies at all. Have you ever thought of it, Miss Kenny? No, I haven't, to tell you the truth, but I would like to reflect on the matter. So much of my time is given to my music that I haven't considered any other career. Well, think about it. It would be in your capacity as a musician that you would be a big drawing card, but you have the necessary looks also, he bowed. And the acting part, I feel quite sure of. Here is my card. Upon your return to New York, call it my office. And in the meantime, please don't make any contracts, will you? I will give you first consideration, she promised him. During this conversation, Eddie had said nothing, but when the producer had moved away from them into the lounge, the boy thought he would sound Margaret out a little on this exciting new prospect. He had seen very few movies in his young life, but those had made a deep impression on his imagination. Could it be that he himself would be a movie actor? What did you think of that fellow, Margaret? He seemed quite anxious to have me sign up. I thought there was much more red tape to being a movie actress. Well, it must be that his spotters, as he called them, have been giving him some real dope about you. After all, Margaret, you are one of the best musicians in America. Margaret knew that Eddie was sincere in his praise of her, but she brushed aside his compliment by saying, I think he was as much interested in having you, Eddie. Well, we'll let the matter drop for the time being. We don't want to have it interfere with our good time in Europe. When we get to our hotel, I will write a letter to Jack and tell him all about it. It might be that he would not want you to get into the movies. After all, he is your father now, you know. That's a good idea, agreed Eddie. Let's leave it all up to Jack. End of chapter 14 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 15 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 15. On the Sea. As soon as Eddie and Margaret got to their hotel rooms, Margaret wrote a letter to Jack. In considering the producer's offer, she was not thinking of herself. Her own future was secure. But she was aware of the great possibilities the prospect held for Eddie. Jack was only a railway engineer, and now that he had assumed the responsibility of raising and training the boy, whatever could be done to help him, Margaret thought she should do. Eddie, too, was interested in the letter, and when it was finished, at Margaret's request, he read it aloud to her. She explained that she wanted to hear how it sounded. Dear Jack, while we were en route from Chicago to New York, Mr. Marcus Rosenbibe, a movie producer, spoke to me about contracting the two of us for his pictures. I told him that such a thing would be impossible until after I returned from Europe, and that I would have to let you decide for Eddie. He left me his card, asking me to call at his office when we get back. I am giving you this news at once so you can turn it over in your mind or even get in touch with the man concerning Eddie's contract, if you decide that is best. As for myself, well, it's just too sudden for me to know what to do. I am going to give it serious thought on my way over, and I wish you would do the same. Write me at your leisure. Eddie and I enjoyed our air trip immensely. We are both feeling fit as fiddles. Our boat sails in the morning, so we are going to bed early tonight to rest up. We will be waiting to hear from you. Eddie sends you his love, and I join with him. Your loving sister, Margaret. And on the following morning, when the great ocean liner steamed out of New York Harbor, Margaret and Eddie bade farewell to America. The March air was raw and cutting, and a heavy gray sky hung overhead. Still, it was not a dismal day. The passengers aboard were all happy. The thrill of the sea voyage was taking hold of them. And now Eddie's memory, stimulated by the fact that he was once more crossing the ocean, began to bring to light bits of incidents and impressions connected with his first ride on a boat, years before. Margaret, listening attentively to all the boy had to say of these recollections, began to consider seriously the meaning of the things he was telling her. Could it be that she was taking Eddie back to his mother without knowing it? Could the child actually have been kidnapped from his home and taken to America? As the United States was lost in the dim distance, these were the questions that deeply worried Margaret. Meanwhile, there were the usual pleasurable activities. The second day at sea, our two musicians were called upon to entertain the passengers. Margaret had not intended to do so, 
but now she thought it would be a means of helping her to forget the things that were crowding in upon her mind. Yet, why should she worry? Had she not told Eddie she would gladly return him to his mother, if that mother could be found? It's different singing on a boat, isn't it, Margaret? asked Eddie with interest. The stages and salons are far more beautiful here, but we don't have such big crowds, and you don't get the nice flowers you used to get at home. It is very different, Eddie, but then it is a change. I remember when I first went to France, there were several famous musicians on the boat. It was then I met Madame Fouard. She is a noted French pianist and has become a good friend of mine. We have been invited to live with her during our stay in France. She has a beautiful, almost a palatial home, with a conservatory larger than our entire house in America. Players and singers often meet at Madame Fouard's to discuss what is happening in the musical world. I have met the best musicians in Europe while staying with her. I am sure she will be delighted to hear you. Toward evening of the third day at sea, Eddie and Margaret ascended to the top deck to view the broad expanse of water and fill their lungs with fresh air. It was, in spite of the season, one of those calm, delightful nights when the first traces of spring are in the air. Here and there the passengers were seated, enjoying the marvelous sunset. From below came soft strains of music, as the great liner sped on like some monster of the deep. Oh, there is another boat over there, Eddie pointed excitedly. It's coming toward us, don't you think? Yes, it is at present. That's because it's going to America. The mail clerk said a ship would pass us on the way. I have written a letter to Jack, and most likely it will go back on that boat. He'll be waiting patiently to hear from us, for I'm sure he will be lonesome. Poor Jack, I feel so sorry for him since his wife died. The vessel gradually drew nearer and finally came to a stop. Then a small boat was lowered over the side of the liner, in which could be seen boxes of supplies and a small sack of mail. The passengers watched with interest as the little skiff was launched. It took an effort on the part of the sailors to row their boat, but they evidently were accustomed to such work. As soon as its contents had been taken off by the waiting vessel, the skiff returned and the journey was resumed. Eddie and Margaret watched the vessel, which had thus briefly crossed their path, till it disappeared in the gathering mists of evening. If they had only known that it was bringing to America a mother bent upon the desperate effort of finding the son who had been separated from her for years. He had been kidnapped when he was hardly more than a baby, and shortly after her husband had been killed. Since then she had been receiving letters from various parts of France demanding money for the return of her boy. Each letter had been answered in closing the money as demanded, and each time in vain. The letters came from different places, and at varying intervals of time, so that the police were unable to find the villainous fellow who had possession of the child. Meanwhile, the one large fortune of the Martyrs was dwindling away. She had almost given up the idea of ever seeing her son again, when one day a packet of money, together with the following letter, reached the widowed childless woman. Madam, some years ago I lost my fortune in gambling, and not being able to meet my creditors, I was obliged to get money by fraud. I knew that you had a considerable fortune, and that you were extremely fond of your son. Then your husband was killed. I realized that, left alone, you would believe any threat against your child, and would give up everything if you thought him in danger. So I made up my mind to kidnap him and get money from you in that way. Several times I was nearly found out, so at last I sent the boy to America with an old friend of mine. For the first year or so after they got there, I heard from my friend at regular intervals. Then he wrote more rarely, and for the last two years I have heard nothing at all, and have consequently been unable to locate the boy. I am sure he has suffered no harm, for my friend is not a bad man. I am still doing my best to find him for you, and will communicate with you should I have the good fortune to locate him. Since I have once more gained a sure footing in my business, I am able to send you part of the money I extorted from you by threat. I am sending it by registered post, for I do not wish you to learn my name. The remainder will come later. The amount here will pay your way to America and other expenses should you wish to go there in search of the boy. All I can tell you to help is that the man to whom I entrusted him was named Georges Rousset. Yours, a repentant friend. Oh God in heaven, protect my child, prayed the mother. Give me the strength necessary to make that long journey and to stand the suspense. 
Oh, my child, wherever you are, pray for your poor mother. Her boy had never ceased to pray for her, and to hope that one day they would be reunited. What would he have done had he known that she was on that boat headed for America? She was going in search of him, and he, without knowing it, was going away from her. Still, God was watching over them, as he always watches over those who put their trust in him. He held in his almighty hand the destinies of both. In the end, all would be well. End of chapter 15 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 16 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 16 On Opposite Shores Just about the time that Madame Martier was arriving in New York, Margaret and Eddie were debarking at a French pier. Our two friends were happy that the sea trip was over. They at once took the train to Paris, where they were met by Madame Fouard's car, and taken to her home. From Margaret's description, Eddie had known he would find it a wonderful place, but the sight which met his eyes was far beyond his expectations. He had often thought that there was no prettier spot than Mount St. Joseph, with its lovely lawn and its fountain. But here, fountains played in every direction, and the smooth velvet of the grass stretched out for acres. "'Well, Margaret,' her distinguished friend greeted her. You look very well. I am very glad indeed to have you here. And this is little Eddie, whom you wrote to me about. What a sweet child he is. You are both welcome. We are in splendid health, Therese. Yes, this is my little Eddie. I am his second mother, you know. I have heard much about you, Eddie, his hostess told him. Great things are expected of you, my child. Thank you, madam. He replied with his own simplicity, This is the most wonderful place you have. I have never seen anything like it before. Ah, Eddie knows the way to my heart, said Madame Fouard. He praises my home. Thank you, child. I love the old-fashioned place. Within its walls are enclosed all that I hold most precious in this life. My dear parents lived here, and here I was born and reared. I would not care to part with it. Eddie was greatly interested in his new surroundings. There were so many things for him to see, and everyone seemed to be at his service. As soon as the first excitement of greetings was over, a tall, well-built man in livery, much like the one who had driven the automobile, came forward at Madame Fouard's nod, and guided Eddie and Margaret to their rooms. "'We must clean up, Eddie, for we are dirty after that ride. Go to your room now and wash, and I'll come to you in a few minutes.' "'Shall I help the boy, madam?' asked the attendant." "'If you would be so kind,' replied Margaret gratefully. Eddie was soon in the care of one to whom he later became very attached. Within a short time, our hero, washed, properly combed, and cleanly attired, made his appearance in the drawing-room, where Margaret joined him a few minutes later. "'I want to have another nice talk with you, Pierre,' said Eddie, as the servant was leaving him. The man bowed a friendly approval. "'You'll find me always at your service, my little man. Call me at any time.' But while luxury and care surrounded Eddie in France, in America the situation of the poor, broken-hearted mother was different. She was alone. Her home of the moment was not a spacious palace, but a simple hotel room, plainly furnished and with few comforts. As soon as she had rested a little, she called out a detective agency and explained her case. She had as yet very little realization of what a great, thickly populated place the United States was. The agency advised her that her best chance of finding her son was to advertise in the newspapers of the larger cities, giving his description and baby photograph, and the name of his custodian. This Madame Martier did, but there were no hopeful results. After spending a week in New York, she informed the chief of the detective bureau that she was going on to Chicago, and would send him her address as soon as she had settled down again. Fervently she prayed the sorrowful mother of Jesus to have compassion on her, and bring her son to her arms once more. Surely the blessed mother heard that prayer, for the bereaved mother was each day a little nearer to finding her treasure. But as yet she had no sign that her prayer was being answered. Instead, it seemed that the farther she went from home, the farther was that for which she longed. And one night, exhausted from disappointed hope, she sat in her own room, sobbing as if her heart were broken. 
but it is the darkest hour that precedes the dawn. On the same day that Madame Martier reached Chicago, Eddie and Margaret arrived at Lourdes. They were taking a few days off to give themselves up to their pilgrimage in the proper spirit. Long did Eddie stand in contemplation of Our Lady's famous shrine. He was old enough to appreciate what it meant. Margaret had explained to him the history of the place, how our Blessed Mother had appeared there several times to the little peasant maiden, Bernadette Subaru, and told her to direct the local priest to have a church erected on the spot in her honor. Margaret also described to Eddie how many miracles had been performed there in favor of the physically and spiritually sick, thronging to the spot in hopes of the Immaculate Mother's intercession. "'We'll offer up our prayers in Holy Communion for my mother, won't we, Margaret?' asked Eddie eagerly. "'I am sure she needs our prayers.' And, oh, yes, we must include your dear mother also. We can't forget her. It is very kind of you to remember her, Eddie. Jack would be very pleased to know that you pray for Mama here at Our Lady's Shrine. Yes, and I must pray for Mother Rose and the other sisters. And when we go to the grotto, I must get a little bottle of water for Mother Rose. You know I promised her I'd do that when we visited her. That's right. I'm glad you remembered. It would be ungrateful on our part to forget her. So Eddie and Margaret spent several days at Lourdes. The great church erected on the hillside absorbed their attention. But what they enjoyed most of all was to kneel before the grotto where Our Lady had stood. They could see the discarded crutches, canes, and chairs, and the many other things which were eloquent witnesses of our Blessed Mother's power with God. On their last afternoon, the two were present at the great square in front of the church for the procession of the Blessed Sacrament, for they knew that it is at that particular time that most of the miracles happen. The theme of all Eddie's prayers was the wish for restoration to his mother. This was the miracle that he implored our Blessed Lady to work for him. When he left for Paris that night, he felt sure that in her own time and her own way she would obtain his request. The following night, Eddie, at a party given in honor of Margaret, sang for his hostess and a crowd of her intimate friends. Madame Fouard herself accompanied the singer at the piano. "'What a wonderful voice!' she exclaimed to Margaret, "'and what a lovable child! You are lucky indeed to have him for your own.' One after another the guests went forward to speak to the singer. Eddie bowed gracefully to his admirers and thanked them in his usual unassuming way for their praise. Before the evening was over, he and Margaret received several invitations from friends of Madame Fouard to attend parties and musicals. Margaret gratefully accepted the honors, and soon the reputation she needed to gain access to the best professional musical circles in France was firmly established. One evening after a performance, Margaret received a letter from Jack. Dear Sister and Eddie, you cannot imagine how I miss you but the loneliness is welcome if it means your success. According to the papers, the Jackson case is now settled. Father Ryan has often inquired about Eddie and hopes that he will sing again for him at the church. I am giving the movie contract very serious consideration. I am inclined to think it might be a very good thing for Eddie. He certainly has a fine voice, and I feel that he would make a great showing on the screen. I will, however, not do anything about the matter until you return." We will want to talk the thing over from every angle. Now do not be in a hurry. Make a good trip of it and enjoy yourselves. I am waiting patiently for you both, and will be at the train when you arrive. Your affectionate, Jack. Jack did not know that there was one even nearer to Eddie, who at that very moment was longing even more ardently than he for the return of the boy, that the child's own mother was not far away, pining for him. Jack had never dreamed that Eddie's mother was living, but something was to happen soon that would put him in a state of great anxiety and pain, though only for a time. End of chapter 16 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 17 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 17. In God's Ways. In the little sacristy at Mount St. Joseph, Father Smith was just unvesting, after having said Mass. Through the windows came the sweet freshness of spring, 
the songs of the mating birds as they twittered and hopped from limb to limb, seemed to bring with them thoughts of new life and hope. Suddenly the good priest's thoughts were interrupted by the sound of a familiar voice behind him. "'Sure, your reverence, it's none but myself, Bridgie Maloney. And I'm coming to ye, father, to go with me to the bedside of a dying man that's calling for a priest.' "'Will ye hurry with me, father, as tis near death's door he is already. "'I'll be with you as soon as I can get ready. "'You have everything prepared for me, haven't you, Bridgie?' "'Indeed, and I have, your reverence. "'Twould not be Bridgie Maloney that would be after coming for a priest without all prepared.' "'Within a short time, Father Smith was on his way with the holy oils into sacramental God. "'Walking along beside him in respectful silence was the good old Irish landlady.' Bridgie, who for many years had kept a neat little boarding-house, was well known to the priest. Often had she, in her own informal way, brought stray sheep back to a sense of their duty, and then hurried off for the chaplain to attend to them. For a long time she had tried to win over this wayward soul to whose ministration Father Smith was now hurrying. And today, today when death was calling him, her prayers were answered. Perhaps if she had discontinued her pleadings when all seemed useless, as it had many a time, God would not have given her the consolation of seeing this unhappy man return to the church. When Father Smith arrived, he found that Bridgie's boast had been justified. There was the little table with its snow-white cover, a crucifix, two candles, napkins, in fact, everything necessary for the administration of the sacraments. Bridgie lighted the candles and then left the room, while the priest proceeded to prepare the sick man for death. Truly the poor woman's prayers had done a world of good, for this invalid was ready and willing to confess his sins, which he did with every mark of real sorrow. Then, as the breath of life was failing him, he made a motion towards something under his pillow. Noticing the gesture, the good priest came to his aid. "'May I help you?' "'It's all there, Father. The paper. The paper I told you about. The story.' Take it, and do what you can with it. Trust me, my dear man. May the good God... The faint voice faltered. The priest took the folded pad and placed it in his pocket. He then administered the last sacraments to the dying penitent. He was just concluding the recommendation for a departing soul when the man breathed his last. May he rest in peace, said the priest. Amen, whispered the landlady, who at Father Smith's summons had returned to kneel at the bedside. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come unto thee. Let us pray. To thee, O Lord, do we commend the soul of thy servant, Georges, that being dead to the world, he may live to thee, and the sins he hath committed through the frailty of his mortal nature, do thou, in thy most merciful goodness, forgive and wash away. Amen. Father Smith then arose from his knees. We were just in time, Bridgie, and I feel sure he is safe. He has left money with me to pay for the funeral expenses and to have some masses said for him. When Father Smith returned to Mount St. Joseph, he examined the papers carefully. He knew they pertained to something the man had confessed to him with such remorse. They were written, mostly in French, which he was able to read fluently, and from the idiom he knew that the man who had written them was well educated. At once he thought of Eddie, for many of the circumstances therein narrated were the same as had attended the boy's arrival at the Mount. As soon as he had mastered the details of the case, he sent a special delivery letter to Jack. At home, in a large easy chair, sat the lonely engineer, thinking of his loved ones beyond the sea. Suddenly his meditation was interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Answering the summons, Jack came face to face with a messenger boy. "'A letter for John Kenny, sir. Is it yours?' "'Right you are, my boy. Thank you.' Jack hurriedly opened the envelope and read, Dear Mr. Kinney, I had a call this morning from an old Frenchman who was very sick. After I heard his confession, he gave me an account, written by himself, of how he had been given a boy to take to America to keep, until such time as he should be sent for. If I am not mistaken, the boy is Eddie. It was the man's request that I do my best to find the child and his mother. He gave me full permission to use the papers for that end. Please call at your earliest convenience, and we will endeavor to straighten matters out. Even if Eddie is not the boy referred to, I would be grateful for your kind assistance. Sincerely yours, Reverend John Smith. For a moment, Jack did not know what to do or think. Was he to lose his newly acquired son? 
Surely this could not be. It was with great foreboding that, bright and early the next morning, Jack presented himself at the mount. He found the good priest, who had been a great friend of the boys, all ready for their conference. Come in, my dear man. How are you? Well, of course, father, you got me quite upset over your letter. Do you really think that it is my Eddie that the man writes about? That's just what we want to find out. Here are the papers. You see, they are written in French. I'll translate it for you. Now that I am sick unto death, I want to straighten my account with God and my fellow men. The one great thing I have worrying me is the part I had in the kidnapping of Jacques Mortier, Jr. The boy was then about four years old. The man who stole him from his home I do not wish to name, as he is a prominent businessman in Paris, and was always very good to me. I will leave him to his own conscience. At the time he stole a child, he had lost everything by gambling, and in order to meet his creditors, he had recourse to this means to get money. He used to pay me for a while after my arrival in America, but when I moved from New York to this place, I took the boy, late one night, to a sister's home for boys called Mount St. Joseph. I gave Jacques a card to give to the one who should find him, and on it I wrote Eddie, which was the name I called him by. I do not know what has become of him, but I trust he can be found and returned to his mother. Full permission is hereby given to use my letters and papers. George's Rousset. Father, it's my boy he had reference to, that's sure, said Jack in agitation, but where the Jacques Merte, the boy's father, live? No mention is made of that. What can we do, father? There may be many people in France by that name. I might write to Margaret about it if you thought it would do any good. She will be coming home in a few weeks. I'll keep the papers a while, replied Father Smith. I have a friend in Paris, a priest who studied with me in Rome. He is well acquainted there. I'll write to him and see what he can do. Come back in about a month, or, better still, I'll get in touch with you as soon as I have a reply. We will leave nothing undone to locate the family, but I wouldn't disturb your sister now, if I were you, or inspire any hopes in the child which may never be realized. Well, it is very kind of you, father, to be willing to undertake all this. Jack tried to keep his own anxiety out of his voice. You will, of course, let me know if there is anything that I can do to help you. Thank you, my dear man. Let's leave it all up to God. He never fails us. Downhearted, Jack made his way home. A feeling of the deepest depression was with him, as he once more sat before the mantel trying to extract comfort from vigorous puffings at his pipe. This child had come into his life at a time when he most needed just such an influence to lift him out of his sorrows. And now, after the cords of your love had grown to bind together the sturdy engineer and the little singer, he could not bear to think of a separation. But, of course, he would not refuse to give up the child. In fact, he could not, should his parents be found. And Jack admitted to himself that this was just. He had done much for Eddie, but still the parents had a right to their own child. With a heavy sigh, Jack made up his mind to bear whatever cross should come his way in regard to the boy. Eddie was his by legal permission only, and that permission had been granted solely because it was believed that the child's parents were dead, or at least unwilling to keep him. Perhaps the parents are dead, Jack thought, or even if they are living, Father Smith may never be able to locate them. Jack lay awake for a long time that night, trying to figure out a possible solution to the quandary he was in. When he did finally go to sleep, it was but to dream of the plans he had made for the son he might soon be going to lose. End of chapter 17 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 18 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 18 Converging Paths Just two days after his visit to Father Smith at Mount St. Joseph, Jack was given a special run from Bryan to Chicago. While waiting there for his cars to be unloaded, he bought a paper from a newsboy. Scarcely had he glanced at the first page when he felt as if he had received a blow. There, in bold type, he read, French woman seeks lost son. Below this heading was a picture of a very young child, which Jack nevertheless clearly recognized to be that of his boy. He read on. Five thousand dollars reward is offered for the recovery or information leading to the same 
of Jacques Morte, Jr., who was kidnapped from his home in Paris and sent to America in 19, and care of one Georges Versailles. The boy is now nine years old, has black hair and blue eyes. Further description cannot be given as he has not been seen by his mother since he was four years old. Please address the chief of detectives or write to Madame Jacques Morte, room 101, Hotel Dothman. Now what do you know about that? Jack spoke automatically, for the moment he felt stunned. Well, it settles a lot of things, if it does nothing else. I have always been afraid, he went on sorrowfully to himself, that I would not be allowed to keep Eddie. Jack had not given a single thought to the $5,000 reward. That was the item that interested him least. He was telling himself that though it would be a dreadful wrench to part with Eddie, it must be done. Jack was a real man, and therefore able to realize the feelings of this poor mother as keenly as his own. At once the engineer resolved to write directly to Madame Marte and ask her to call at Margaret's home in Bryan. This was the quickest way of meeting her. He had to bring back his train on schedule, which meant that there was no time to establish communications in Chicago. He therefore sent her the following note. Dear Madame Martier, I have seen the item in the Chicago, concerning your lost boy, and hasten to write to you to the effect that vital information bearing on the case can be secured at the address given below. Should you wish to call there personally, which is the most advisable course, directions for reaching Brian by train will be given by the ticket agent in Chicago. If you will let me know the time of your intended arrival, I will make it my business to meet you at the station. Sincerely yours, John Kenny. It would be very difficult for anyone to describe how Eddie's mother felt when this message reached her the following morning. Her heart and mind were in a turmoil. At last she was to find out about her child. Yet she had a premonition that she was not to meet him at once, for the letter said nothing about this. Where could he be? Why had not this John Kenny, whatever his relation to her son, been more explicit in his letter? She, who had waited so long, must wait still longer. That same night a telegram came from Chicago notifying Jack that Madame Martier would arrive in Bryan early the next morning. As the engineer was due to make another special run the next day, there was nothing for him to do but phone the freight yard at once, asking that another man be given the job. The request was reluctantly granted, for there was a shortage of men on the line just then. The next morning Jack was up at dawn. Long before that he had been awake. As train time neared, he made his way to the station to welcome the mother of his adopted son. All the way there, Jack was trying to form a picture of his guest, but he missed the reality by far. Instead of the stout, rather elderly Frenchwoman he had expected, Madame Mortier turned out to be a tall, slender, attractive lady of no more than thirty. She was dressed in black and wore a heavy veil, for she still mourned the death of her husband. Jack greeted her in a very friendly fashion, and she returned the salutation in broken English, which was nevertheless gracious and charming. Although my home is in a different town, I have been living with my sister most of the time, since the death of my wife, he explained. But, as Margaret is not home at present, an aunt of mine who lives here in the city has charge of the house. She is expecting you. And is my Jacques here? No, madam, Jacques or Eddie, as we call him, is with my sister in Paris. In Paris? wailed the mother. Yes, madam. They have been there for some time now. I will explain all that later. Here is the house. Just come right in, for my aunt is prepared for you. In the comfortable dining room, Mrs. Elpers, Jack's and Margaret's aunt, had a delicious breakfast prepared, to which Madame Mortier was led as soon as she removed her hat and wrap. You must be very tired, madam said Mrs. Elpers sympathetically, but I am sure you will be delighted to hear about your little son. My nephew can tell you everything, for he has befriended the lad and loves him dearly. Yes, Mrs. Elpers, the suspense has been very wearing. But come, Mr. Kenny, tell me about my little boy. Is he well? Yes, Madame Martier, well and happy. Jack plunged into his recital. I have known your boy, whom we call Eddie, for several months now. I was sitting on the step of my engine one morning, shortly after the death of my beloved wife, thinking about her, and at the same time trying to console myself with the thought that perhaps she was happier than I could ever expect to be on this earth. 
Just then I was interrupted by a little boy who came up to me and wanted to know why I was so sad. I asked him what his name was and where he lived. He told me that he was called Eddie and that until the day before our meeting he had been living at Mount St. Joseph Orphanage. Jack unfolded the story in detail to the astonished mother. Tears of joy rolled down her cheeks as she at last took in the fact that her son was not only alive, but in safe and loving care. And it would be only a question of a short time until she was reunited to him again. Shall I write to my sister, madam, and have her come home at once, or... Jack hesitated. What would you suggest? I would like to have you stay here as long as you will with my aunt and have a complete rest. I gladly accept your invitation, Mr. Kinney, replied Eddie's mother gratefully, for to say the truth, I almost feel I shall collapse. The long suspense, now so suddenly broken, I fear must unsettle me for a while. Surely, madam, put in Jack's aunt, we shall be very happy to have Eddie's mother stay with us. Mrs. Elper's hospitality was accepted, and Madame Martier began a pleasant period of rest and care, in which she was watched over by both Jack and his aunt. Within a month a letter came to her from Paris. Dear, dear Mama, you cannot imagine how happy I am to know that I really have a dear Mama living. I have heard through Margaret that you are staying at our home in Bryan. Oh, I cannot wait until I see you. Since coming here, I have begun, little by little, to recall things that took place in my life in Paris before I was taken away. But, of course, these are only faint memories. I wish you would come here and bring my dear pal Jack along with you. Margaret says that it is your wish that we stay here, although I would like to come to you now. Please hurry and come to me. I have so many things to tell you. Give my love to dear Jack. Your loving son, Jacques. Madame Martier read and reread this, the first letter ever addressed to her as a mother. Then, unable to restrain her emotions, she burst into tears. For years she had looked forward to this, some direct word from her son to her, and now it had arrived. Read this letter, Jack, she said, when she was able to speak. Read what my dear boy says. Oh, it is the sweetest letter I have ever received. And to think that little Jacques wrote it to me, his mother. As Jack read the letter, he felt his love for the boy increase in his heart. Must they be separated again? Was the great expanse of water that divided two continents always to lie between them? Look, Jack, he says, I wish you would come here and bring my dear pal Jack along with you. What do you think of that? My dear, I noticed that. Jack smiled at her tenderly. In these weeks they had come to know and appreciate each other very deeply. He is fixing things up for us, isn't he? Would you like to have me go to Paris with you? Indeed I would. Both you and Margaret could live with us, for I have a large home in France. But you aren't going to hurry back, are you? About the first of the month, Jack. That would give me plenty of time before I go to arrange a ball, as you say in America, a party for your aunt and the great host of friends I have made during my stay here. Let's make it an announcement party, dear, said Jack, taking her hand, an announcement that you and I will be married. Jack! And Eddie's mother smiled at him happily. End of chapter 18 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 19 of Eddie of Jackson's Gang by Brother Ernest Ryan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 19 Double Ties When Mother Mary's altar was decked with gorgeous blooms for the opening of her month of flowers, Jack happily led his bride to the altar, and there at the feet of God's mother promised lifelong fidelity to her whom the Lord had given him. Then the friends of the bride and groom gathered to honor the couple and to give them a grand farewell. Arrangements were made for the trip to France. Margaret and Eddie, intensely excited over the happy event, had written they would be at the pier to meet them when the boat docked. Mother Rose and the other good sisters were generously rewarded for all they had done for Eddie. When the great ocean liner steamed out of New York Harbor, Jack and his wife bid adieu to America and to those they left behind. It was, however, not to be a permanent adieu, but simply a temporary one. For, as Mrs. Kenny said, in taking leave of Mrs. Elpers, I love America and the people I have met here, and I must return. It was a happy voyage for both. 
when after several days at sea the coastline of the continent loomed up out of the waters the thrill of expectation felt by the pair on the boat was duplicated by that of the pair on the land eddie and margaret were at the dock long before the liner was ready to be towed into port through his large field glasses jack could discern the loved ones on the shore there are little eddie and margaret look through the glasses dear that is your son our son i knew that they would be here and i bet they have been waiting for us a long time it was indeed a crowning moment for the mother there among the crowd on his own native soil stood her little son he who had for so long a time been separated from her my god i thank thee jack is that really he how wonderful he looks oh i can hardly wait until we get to him to think that i have not seen him for over five years but i mustn't think about that now oh dear jack how happy we'll be we must not forget to thank almighty god and his dear mother for all they have done for us yes answered jack god has been good to us what greater gift could he have given us at present we must indeed thank him dear let us have some masses said for there is nothing more pleasing to him than to see us grateful for what he does for us we will go to lord's his wife replied eagerly and there on the spot on which our blessed mother appeared we will offer ourselves anew to her service she has been watching over us and over our child and i am sure that she will approve if we do that just then the plank was lowered and the passengers in chattering groups descended to the pier arm in arm the two went down to be embraced by the watchers on shore who had waited so long for them mamma was all that eddie could say for he soon found himself hugged so tightly that he could scarcely breathe my dear dear boy while eddie and his mother were thus clasped in a mutual embrace jack and margaret were exchanging warmest greetings soon jack introduced his sister and his wife to each other and the four made their way to the large group of friends who stood in the background there were madame fouard and her intimates waiting to welcome margaret's brother and his wife and there were also the old friends of the former madame martier eager to greet her husband and her newly found son after a long ride on the train the party arrived at the fine martier residence the once sad desolate mansion rang with the happy voices of the guests and eddie sang a beautiful welcome to his dear mother and father it was a grand day indeed the first of many happy ones to be spent by our reunited four we'll go back to america some day eddie and make a lovely home for ourselves there said his mother as the day finally drew to a close and do you know i have a chance to get into the movies yes but we won't think about that for a while yet was her reply and i'll call on mother rose and the sisters and try to find little benny and tim they were very good to me when i was a poor homeless boy like them and now that i have everything i will try to make them happy the end end of chapter 19 recording by maria therese end of eddie of jackson's gang by brother ernest ryan